Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Monday, December 10th, 2018. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Bernard Harcourt, author of The Counter-Revolution, How Our Government Went to War Against Its Own Citizens. Also on the program today, no one remotely sane wants to be Trump's chief of staff. Meanwhile, Chuck and Nancy head to the White House, fortunately and hopefully constrained by their now stronger left flank. And on the week of the six year anniversary of Sandy Hook, new report shows that 2018, the worst year for gun violence in schools in history. Meanwhile, Friday... Filings drop against Cohen and Manafort. First off, the Southern District of New York U.S. Attorney's Office, their files document Cohen's felonious activity and directly implicates Donald Trump in that felony. Ain't going to mean much, but it's nice to know. Manafort uh, filing reveals even a broader range of contacts between administration and transition officials with Russian operatives. Meanwhile, the driver who killed, the Nazi driver who killed Heather Heyer, found guilty of murder. Coming out of uh, Charlottesville. Trump calls for an even bigger defense budget, now topping $750 billion. Antitrust lawsuit expands to an investigation of price fixing amongst 300 drugs by a pharma cabal. Net neutrality's last chance is days away, and Chicago charter school teachers end their strike successfully. Meanwhile, last week, I uh, forgot to mention the Boston Marriott strike is a big win for workers, or could be, nationwide. And lastly, Gavin McGinnis is now officially unemployed. All this and more. On today's program, ladies and gentlemen, yes, it's another Friday, uh, excuse me, Monday, Friday, if I remember correctly, was last week. Uh, Michael is out today. He's he's getting, I don't know what's getting, uh, getting his hair done. It's a hair done day because it's a big week for him. Um, But everybody else is uh, here uh, with uh, bells on. Um, let me just, uh, touch on this news because this is, you know, they say, um, in, um, in drama, you want it, you put that loaded gun on the, uh, in the drawer at the beginning of, uh, act one, and then it makes everything tense for everybody. And, um, so check off and, um, and it makes everything tense for everybody. And uh, we don't, we don't want to do that. 
Uh, so let's just get this out of the way. Uh, the Proud Boys founder, Gavin McGinnis, uh, apparently has lost his gig with his show, Get Off My Lawn. Fuck you forever. That's my common quote I say. It's fuck you forever. We're done. Yeah, that's his uh, common quote. He says forever. Um, Glenn Beck said, get off my network. Apparently, uh, Glenn Beck. Uh, now, as you recall, last week we reported that The Blaze and CRTV merged. Now, I, it, I, I don't... Listen, let me just put it this way. If you work for either one of those entities and you want to tell me stuff about it, yeah. you can email me at majorityreporters at gmail.com and uh, tell me stuff because I'm fascinated. I, I, I've done some digging to see if I could figure out who funds conservative review. They paid out a massive, massive... Uh, fee to Mark Stein a couple of months ago, $4 million in an arbitration hearing. This is from a mediator. So it's not even like a court case. It means that he had to have had a contract at least that big. And there's no way Mark Stein is going to generate that type of revenue for anyone. I'm sorry. And so I can only imagine what these people have been getting paid. And I'm curious if they must have exercised some type of like morality clause or morals clause with Gavin, because otherwise we'd be hearing him about getting paid out. Um, I, I, my understanding was no one was watching a show, but he obviously provided them some publicity. Now it appears with the blaze and CRTV merging that they don't want that kind of publicity anymore. Now, um, there's some report that Glenn Beck is on the radio right now talking about how he had no idea what was going on. So there's like the Trumpian, like I had, I, I just got a call that you got fired by Kelly. I can't believe it. I'm really, really upset about this. Of course, I've, I'm not in touch with what's going on. Isn't so, he like supposed to be woke now too? Glenn Beck? Yeah, that was like. I think that lasted for a short period of time. from The Daily Show. Yeah, I think that was uh, that that was like a three month period. You know, uh, when your business is going down the tubes, you will uh, attempt to do a bunch of different things. Now, Glenn Beck's business, as you know, uh, contracted. I mean, tremendously over the past three years, uh, epically. But he still has a good email list. And so uh, combining with CRTV, which may still have some cash and some shows, uh, who knows? But um for whatever reason, Gavin McGinnis is now without a gig on. Uh, and so I, I would say if I'm Gavin right now, I'm doing one of two things. I'm either saying like, well, screw this. I might as well go back to being um, the uh, white nationalist that I was. But the problem is he doesn't have the ability to make any money off it now. And there's a lot of heat on that now. Yeah, he just wasn't. I mean, he wasn't even making money. He wasn't drawing people then. So it's not like he has a big audience. If he had a big audience, he could go do what we're doing. This is easy to set up. I was lucky. I came from Air America. I had an email list of people. I had an audience and I was able to reach them. Theoretically, right? Gavin has an audience. And to set up a camera and uh, a microphone, he's got this stuff lying around in his basement. So I would suggest to Gavin, go down into your basement Start doing your show. You're funny, as far as you know. And so um, so either that'll happen or Gavin is going to sort of suddenly like maybe go into uh, some type of program, you know, and uh, come out the other end and say, my, I've dealt with my problems. Uh, whatever they were, drug, alcohol, um, you know, uh, insecurity, um, uh, incontinence, whatever the problem was, I've dealt with it. I've been in an inpatient facility for, you know, 60 days or 30 days. And now I'm coming out and I'm, I'm a much more benign guy. And maybe I can get a job at VH1 hosting some weird uh, sideshow or something. Yeah, he was just intoxicated for 20 years on the kinds of drugs that turn you into a racist, misogynist piece of shit. I mean, that may require a 60-day stint to get over. But that's, those are the two options. That's it. So, uh, as you said before, 
sound drop. Fuck you forever. That's my common quote I say. It's fuck you forever. We're done. Yep. There you go. You should have trademarked that. Uh, meantime. Oh, yeah. Where are we? Where are we? Where is my list of... Uh, oh, yeah. Here we go. Oh, one of today's... Uh, one of today's sponsors is Privacy at privacy.com slash majority. Privacy.com is a totally free service. It lets you buy anything online without having to give out your credit card number. And it lets you prevent companies from overcharging you. Here's how it works. You take a couple of minutes to link your bank account to your privacy.com account. And then you're able to create a virtual credit card numbers, which are linked to your bank account. You can create as many virtual cards as you want. You can delete them. You can freeze them and unfreeze them. You can set limits on each card. It's great for signing up for free trials because you can just create a virtual card once and delete it knowing you'll never be charged once the trial is over. Uh, th I mean, not only have I started using this, but I've read up on it quite a bit. And um, People who are uptight about their credit card information being stolen, about getting overcharged, like I am, uh, give this uh, service big thumbs up. And apparently uh, they get their uh, cut from, you know, more or less like the way credit cards do in terms of uh, a fee. But it doesn't come from the consumer. So it's great for signing up for free trials. You can create a virtual card once, delete it, knowing you'll never be charged once the trial is over. That's also awesome. There's a lot of stuff out there. I'm like, I'll take the 30 days, check this out. And then you forget. And then, you, you know, uh, six weeks later, you realize like, ah, I've been charged. You can avoid that. It protects you when companies get hacked and people's information is stolen because you're not giving out your real credit card number. That's extremely helpful. Each card is locked to a merchant, so you're totally protected against fraud and unauthorized use of your card. Privacy.com's mobile app and desktop browser extension make it incredibly easy to manage your wallet of virtual cards and allow you to autofill your virtual card number at a click of a button when you're shopping online. There are countless different advantages to using a service like this to pay your bills and buy things online. You can find out more, get 100% free and unlimited access by going to privacy.com slash majority. That's privacy.com slash majority. We have a link uh, in our podcast description and in uh, below our video. Another of today's sponsors, Skillshare. And the first 500 people, I don't think there would be that many left now, but check it out. Who Go to skl.sh slash majority are going to get two whole months of totally free access to Skillshare's entire library of super quality online courses and tutorials. Skillshare is a vibrant online learning community that offers courses on everything from design to video editing, to photography, business, technology, cooking, mediation, everything in between. There are Skillshare courses for everyone. You'll have no problem finding courses that will be useful to you in both your personal and your professional life. You can sharpen your skills with something you already love doing or learn how to do something that you've been waiting to learn to do, sometimes in my case, for decades. They have courses for entrepreneurs, courses on computer coding, web development, personal nutrition. I probably could use that one too. Learning new languages, Photoshop. That one is on my list. You name it. Like I've been mentioning, I was very excited this weekend because I uh, I took like one of the uh, I watched the the knife cutting course, you know, for a way you do it, chef, and um, I used some of that technique on an onion this weekend as I made lackeys. Very nice. Yeah, knife cutting one hundred and one. I felt pretty good about it. I don't. I mean, I, I think people can probably get a little more ambitious with some of these other courses, but. Uh, you get two entire months of free access to every single course offered by Skillshare by going to skl.sh slash majority. Just think of everything you'll have at your fingertips for two whole months. Again, that's skl.sh slash majority. I put a link uh, in the, again in the um, podcast description and underneath any uh, video you may watch. Um, lastly, there is no need to suffer through another sleepless night. I used this product last night. Calming Comfort by Sharper Image is the luxurious 
weighted blanket that helps you relax so you can fall asleep and stay asleep naturally. 15 pounds. It's designed with high-density comfort fill to provide exactly the right amount of weight to help relax your body. It mimics the soothing feeling of being hugged, helps the production of serotonin and melatonin. You can sleep better, feel great, and stress less. Plus, made with super soft velveteen material, Calming Comfort is 100% machine washable and dryer safe. That's a big deal. A lot of the um, the comfort blankets that you get, the weighted ones, you can't wash them in the washing machine. That's super annoying. Um, oh, you know what else is great about Calming Comfort uh, weighted blanket? If you want my son Saul to come in, to your bed, to sleep with you, because he likes your blanket, this is the one to get. It's not guarantee, though. Now, I can't guarantee that, I mean, because I don't know how far he'll walk. It'll improve but, the chances. But let me put it this way. You get one, you have it, I will tell him to go there. Just understand, it's going to happen about 5.15 in the morning. <laughs> Calm and Comfort Weighted Blanket comes with a 90-day anxiety-free, stress-free, best night's sleep of your life, a life guarantee from the Sharper Image. Right now, for our listeners only, you can go to calmingcomfortblanket.com. That's all one word, calmingcomfortblanket, obviously then .com. Use the promo code MAJORITY at checkout. Receive 15% off the displayed price. That's Calming Comfort blanket.com promo code majority and because you can't put a price on a great night's sleep go online now calming comfort blanket.com promo code majority for your special discount today um so as we've said apparently they cannot find anybody to be chief of staff look how long have they been talking about firing john kelly i mean months and months and months and apparently, Trump was negotiating and has been talking to and assuming that Nick Ayers, the chief of staff of Mike Pence, was going to move over into this position. And it is unclear why Ayers isn't doing it. I've seen a couple of things. One, there's something to do with Greitens. He's got some tied into that, that scandal. The, uh, the former governor of uh, Missouri, was it? Um, and there's also people who say, like, he wants to get out of the White House. He just he doesn't want to be tied to Trump because the stuff is going to come down. And he obviously can't stay and be Pence's chief of staff because Trump's going to be like, wait, what? You turn me down, but you can work for him, not for me. That's no good. So you got to take one for the team. It's a, you know, sacrifice fly. You walk out of the building, essentially. But the Fox and Friends guys, they have another theory as to why no one who in their, their right mind wants to be even come f like within feet of this job. Well, these jobs are they're very difficult. The president apparently works around the clock. They don't get paid a lot <laughs> of money when you consider how expensive Washington, D.C. is. And then you have Nick Ayers, who says he wants to be with his family. He has triplets. He does. Three Six year old triplets. Young, young children wants to go back to Georgia, put hashtag Georgia on the tweet. Right. Mm. It does. Mm. Yeah, he's got Georgia on his mind. I don't know if he'd be able to keep up. He's, oh, incidentally, for some uh, like, ungodly reason, this young guy, right? Fairly young guy, he's managed to amass. What is it, $30 million in the course of his public service? <laughs> wow. Mike, can I just have you achieve a staff? Is that basically what's happened there? That, that's basically what happened. Just and they give thought, me yours. I think, I think at just at one point they realized, like, oh, this isn't going to be good for uh, Pence and for Ayers. It's not going to be good for them. So uh, time to leave the building. But, of course, it's because it's so expensive in D.C. I remember when these guys were going on and on about how difficult it was for people like AOC. Yeah. They laughed at that notion. And I got news for you. When you go down as a congressperson, you've got to maintain two residences. One in your home district, one in, in D.C. When you, have, when you have $30 million, you don't have to go to Georgia. You can bring your family to D.C. when you're working full-time for the White House. So eh, it seems a little bit. And of course, you know, Steve Mnuchin, 
I think he can afford to live in Washington. Apparently, he's turned down the president. Mick Mulvaney's already there. Wait, Mnuchin was going to be chief of staff? They offered it to him, apparently. Oh. That's what it's being reported. No. I don't know. Well, I, I don't know, know if you should do that. Oh. Little, little close. But, uh, all right, folks, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to be talking to Bernard Harcourt. He is the Isidore and Seville uh, Sulzbacher Professor of Law and Professor of Political Science at Columbia University, author of The Counter-Revolution, How Our Government Went to War Against Its Own Citizens. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. It is a pleasure to welcome to the program the Isidore and Seville Solbacher Professor of Law and Professor of Political Science at Columbia University and author of his latest, The Counter-Revolution, How Our Government Went to War Against Its Own Citizens. Bernard Harcourt, welcome to the program. Thank you, Sam Cedar. Um, so, uh, let's start with this, uh, this question, uh, or, or let's start from here. I mean, you write that we, that our government has been in a, a, a what you call a state of exception for, right. uh, ab about 20 years. What, what does that mean? Yeah. So, you know, um, I, I actually argue that it's, it's become so normalized, uh, that what, would ordinarily be thought of as a state of exception or as exceptional has just become the way we've come to govern in this country. So what I'm arguing essentially is that since 9-11, um, uh, we've uh, adopted a new way of governing and, and, and controlling society uh, in the United States. Um, and it comes from the way that we started to engage foreign countries in Iraq and Afghanistan and more broadly, but that that method kind of has come home to roost. Uh, and and what, I, what I argue is that it's really a form of counterinsurgency warfare uh, that we started to use after 9-11 uh, in our war in Iraq that uh, gradually expanded a across military operations and into foreign affairs so that we were starting to use counterinsurgency paradigms uh, outside of the war zone, and that those, those ways of governing, those ways of controlling populations have come home and have been domesticated, and we're using them at home. And what I'm, what I'm talking about are the methods of counterinsurgency warfare uh, that basically involve kind of identifying an, an internal enemy um, uh, which, uh, of course, uh, in Iraq or, or Afghanistan would be uh, the, 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 the supporters, the, originally al-Qaeda, uh, and now we've extended to uh, ISIS. Um, uh, uh, but that, that mentality of trying to identify that uh, uh, internal enemy and then uh, eliminate it, but also win the hearts and minds of the population, uh, is a way of thinking and a way of governing that we've now transplanted back to the United States, so that so that now, uh, particularly uh, under the Trump administration, but this was true previously. It's been true since really since 9/11. Um, we're we're using this notion of an internal enemy to kind of govern and and pacify Americans. And you know, I think you hear it very clearly when President Trump talks so much about the caravan, uh, the caravan, which is intended to identify a whole set of uh, internal enemies in this country 
of kind of undocumented, uh, mostly uh, uh, Latino or Hispanic uh, undocumented uh, uh, pe- persons, but uh, more broadly, it becomes it becomes kind of Mexican Americans, etc. And that that idea of an internal enemy, or or with the Muslim ban, right? The idea mm-hmm. that uh, we had to be so careful about you know, uh, all Muslims, but also uh, American Muslims. And that, that idea of the internal enemy starts to be what we use to govern uh, in this country um, and, 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 to, and to quiet us, uh, to quiet the population, to, to, to kind of win the hearts and minds of the, of the, of the American people. Now. Okay, so let's um, and and um, uh, and 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 I should know that I, I think you started the book and anticipated the book um, as uh, coming out with a uh, you know uh, during maybe at the beginning of a, a Clinton administration. So right, um, right. Uh, Trump's right. ascendancy has has sort of solidified some of your your thesis. Yeah. Um, right. But let's go. But- let's go. Let's go prior to to, to 9-11 and just or, or, or give me a sense of the development of this counterinsurgency strategy, because on some level, sure. well, I mean, let, 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 do that and then I'll, 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 I'll take it from there. Oh, sure. OK. Yeah. So um, the, the kind of the counterinsurgency approach was a, a mode of warfare that really was developed mostly in the 1950s and 60s. I mean, there were precursors of kind of uh, in the Philippines when, when the U.S. fought the war in the Philippines and at the beginning of the 20th century, but really, it was really kind of refined in the 1950s during the colonial uprisings and during the wars of independence in, uh, in Indochina for the French or Algeria, uh, for the French Malaya, for the British, and of course Vietnam. Uh, for the United States. So it was a different way of doing warfare, uh, of, uh, of being at war, uh, different from the more classical kind of large battlefield uh, style uh, of warfare with strategies that were very different. It was, sometimes it was called unconventional warfare, sometimes it was called anti-guerrilla warfare. Uh, it came to be known as counterinsurgency warfare. It had a number of names. Some, some called it modern warfare. But it, it's, it, it's this idea of kind of the unconventional way of fighting war, which is uh, when you have a very different kind of enemy. Right, so and it's a- asymmetric, right? I mean, that is uh, right. the, okay. Right, yeah. I mean, it's asymmetric because you're not fighting a large, um, uh, uh, another, uh, an opponent on, on a battlefield with, you know, many soldiers or, or battalions or tanks lined up against you. You're fighting, you're fighting in, the, in, the, in the brushes, in the bushes, in the wherever it is, in the kasbah, against an insurgent faction, an armed revolutionary insurgent faction. That's where it kind of came from. Um, in the colonies, mostly. And, and Professor, and so we, we should yeah. say that it is almost, I mean, maybe not exclusively, but it, but I think, I mean, you tell me, associated with colonial projects, right, with imperialistic projects. Someone is yeah. in, is um, um, yeah. occupying uh, someone else's country, essentially. Exactly, right. I mean, this was... It was, it was this, this mode of warfare really emerged hand-in-hand hand with... Uh, the colonial enterprise, um, and uh, and it was it was refined predominantly during the anti-colonial uprisings, and so it's really tied to that notion of having an internal enemy in the population that you are governing, right? The colonial population having having a small group of insurgents and and having an insurrection. Um, of course, uh, it, it was it was. Um, the, the theories that were developed, so, so the theories that were developed in the 1950s by French commanders in Indochina and in Algeria and British in Malaya, uh, people like uh, David uh, Galula or Roger Tranquier, uh, French commanders, or, or Thompson, the British uh, counterinsurgency uh, commanders, uh, those, those were developed um, against uh, insurrections that had often a Maoist, uh, communist um, um, uh, inspiration to them. And so a lot of the strategies that were developed in a very interesting way kind of took uh, Mao's way of thinking about the population 
um, and tried, in effect, to do what Mao was doing, but better against against the Maoist insurgents, or just against the you know the Viet Cong, for instance. Um, and and the idea here was that um, Mao had been a great strategist. Of course, he'd succeeded in the in the Chinese Revolution uh, in the late 1940s. So. Um, uh, he, but he had a particular vision of society, and you know there are those famous quotes of Mao about the fact that you know the the insurgents need to swim in the water like fish, uh, and and that idea was basically that you had a small group of insurgents that needed to befriend and win the sympathy of a passive majority, um, in order then to uh, expel the what they considered to be uh, what they considered to be the, the oppressive uh, minority that was um, uh, maintaining rule in the country. Now, what's really interesting is that the French, the British, the American commanders who adopted counterinsurgency theory basically kind of took a hook, line, and sinker, the kind, the kind of view that um, Mao had of society, of there being a small insurrectional group, of there being a, a passive majority, uh, the passive masses who could go one way or the other, uh, and of, of a small counter-revolutionary minority as well. And so that vision of the world was essentially adopted by the counterinsurgents, but then, of course, they flipped it uh, upside down in order to then try to you know, target and eliminate the small uh, minority of, uh, of insurgents uh, and to win the hearts and minds of the population. Now, that's what developed in the 1950s and 60s as counterinsurgency theory. Um, the RAND Corporation was really important to its development. Um, and, uh, and it was used, of course, abroad, not, I mean, uh, uh, only intermittently uh, successfully. I mean, it was used very much, for instance, in, the, in Algiers during the Battle of Algiers to wipe out uh, the FLN at that point, but of course they lost the war, um, so it wasn't, it wasn't ultimately uh, successful. Um, but it had certain techniques uh, that were involved, so the use of torture uh, for purposes of interrogation, getting information. I mean, you have, to get, you have to get total information on the population, not just on the people that you're targeting, because uh, you need to be able to distinguish uh, that small active insurgency from the general population. So you want uh, these forms of total information awareness, which, for instance, in Algeria was done with torture. You want to you want to really target heavily and 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 brutally uh, that small minority, and that was done through forms of basically summary executions, uh, people being thrown out of helicopters into the Mediterranean, and and you wanted to work on the population, which was the idea of. Uh, the hearts and minds, what, what developed in Vietnam is the hearts of the work uh, that's called hearts and minds, trying to win over the population and their sympathies. Uh, th those strategies were kind of uh, uh, refined during those uh, colonial and anti-colonial wars. Um, and um, then after 9-11, uh, what I would argue is that we, we then turned to those strategies uh, after 9-11 and, uh, and refined them more and started expanding them and ultimately uh, bringing them home and domesticating them. And so, and and, and I I remember during those uh, early years of the uh, Iraq War, hearing stories that uh, they were playing Battle of uh, for Algiers uh, in in the uh, Pentagon. In the Pentagon, and right. and and um, uh, to a certain extent, uh, Donald Rumsfeld wanted to rechange, you know change our military to reflect this new reality where, uh, you know, right. this post-World War, uh, World War, I mean, excuse me, Cold War reality where we're going to be going in and we're going to be, uh, from the perspective of the Maoists, we're going to be the minority oppressors of, right. uh, and it's basically just, um, you know, two factions on one side of a sort of uh, of a passive middle, I guess, you know, right. extensive right. middle that aren't willing right. to uh, pick up a gun on either side, essentially, right. but might right. provide uh, food support. or support or something. Yeah. something yeah. And, and eventually kind of eventually the kind of consent and legitimacy that a, uh, that a government needs really to run, you know, um, I mean, 
so, uh, it, you know, in the end, um, governments do need uh, some, uh, you know, a, a, a acceptance on behalf of the vast majority of the population. Otherwise, they just, you know, can't function properly. And so it's that winning that kind of the, 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 the passive masses that on um, this theory – uh, is is what matters what matters most now so, um, and, and at the beginning you were in, entirely right I mean to to return to you know the Rumsfeld era uh, the early era uh, post nine eleven um, we did see precisely the kind of techniques that had been used uh, in Algeria being used uh, by uh, U S uh, forces and by the CIA so the, the extensive torture of um, of uh, those captured. Um, including, actually, when you compare um, uh, some of the use of torture, it, it was even it was even more brutal. I mean, for so for instance, the Senate torture report found that uh, on one uh, suspect, uh, you know, water was administered 183 times. I mean, 183 applications of water, water yeah. uh, during uh, during waterboarding, which was much more extensive, actually, uh, than um, than. Than what was used uh, in Algeria, but um, but so these different uh, strategies come together of, of trying to get total information, which was also done through NSA uh, um, uh, programs like Prism and uh, Upstream, etc. At, at one point uh, in 2002, there was an attempt to institute TIPS, I guess, which was a right. total information. Um, uh, right. Total information. Pro I, I can't remember what what it stood for. Program, right, but at one right, point, they right. were going it to have yeah. postmen and cable cable uh, service people when they come into your house, uh, basically report on you if you had like you know the functional equivalent of a Che Guevara poster hanging in uh -huh. uh, uh, in your apartment. All right, but so, but let me ask you this: so who? When we say uh, we, right, when we say w we've adopted yeah. these things, yeah, yeah. who yeah, 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 who yeah. are those entities and by yeah. what manner? Yeah. And, and, and I would okay. also add, maybe I'm loading up this question too much, but in the scenarios that we're talking about, there's a pretty clear insurgency, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's the right. oppressive, right. there's the people who are right. the, 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 that right. come into the country and try and take over the country, and then there's a pretty clear insurgency we know who they right. are because they're right. blowing up things uh, or they're taking over depots or they're you know uh destroying a bridge or or, or controlling a bridge in the countryside what well, how did right. what, what's the process in which we manufacture that right right yeah so there's a lot in that question yeah sorry um, about let that let me just hit let me just hit a few things uh, and try and give you the the, the 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 arc of my argument here. You, you started by talking about the we. Uh, who is the we? You know, and and that's a tricky one because um, I I, uh, I let me just start by saying, and then I'll, and then I'll explain a little bit the trajectory. But I I, I don't want to always be pointing fingers at at at, uh, at other people and and always talking about you know they doing this to to us or something because in in large part we're we're a part of all of this uh, way of governing, and, uh, and 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 even you know the, even even when we're protesting, I mean, the, the fact that you know we're not protesting enough <laughs> to to end this in some way makes us all, I feel, somewhat kind of a, a part of it. But I'll come back to that. But let me get to the other part of the question, which is, you know, how does it get domesticated? How does it come back? And how is it different in this country when there isn't? Uh, an uprising or an, uh, an insurrection. Um, so, uh, you know, I argue that the the way that it comes back is basically through um, forms of of technology and know how that uh, come back uh, f mostly through military through the military. So, uh, a ton of uh, Department of Defense programs that allow police departments, for instance, to buy all of the equipment. Um, and all the tanks and all the scopes and the night scopes and the and the uh, 
and the weapons, etc., that mean that pretty soon our domestic police departments are starting to look as if uh, they're straight out of some counterinsurgency manual. Right. Right. This and is the, the 1033 see, program, I think it, they call it. Exactly. Or? Okay. Exactly. Right. That's the DOD program that allows the excess property. Uh, to be bought at a very low cost by police departments that then load up on, you know, armored tank vehicles and and night scopes and just the full military gear that all of a sudden you've got, you know, and the pictures when, when we saw, for instance, the, the protests at Ferguson right. or in Baltimore, where all of a sudden you're, you've got civilians in T-shirts facing against what looks as if it's a military, a, a police that functionally looks like a military had just walked out of some moat in Afghanistan, right? So you've got a lot of equipment that's coming back that way. You've got a lot of know-how, right? So what happens is in, in 2006, uh, General David Petraeus, who, who's head of operations of, in, in, in Iraq, and um, uh, basically rewrites the counterinsurgency manual um, and uh, distributes it to all of the soldiers. And that... 2006 manual was very interesting because it was really uh, it really was built on the theoretical work of the French and British uh, commanders. Um, David Petraeus is a is a is a erudite uh, uh, scholarly uh, general uh, who as had been who was very infatuated by the uh, the French and British uh, counterinsurgency commanders and who inserted them all over. Uh, that manual. Uh, so it was very much infused by uh, the counterinsurgency in the 1950s and 60s. But of course, that manual then gets distributed to everybody and all of, the, of our brave men and women who uh, are in the army uh, fighting our wars um, then imbibe it, right? It becomes kind of second nature for, for everyone. Everyone starts to see the world in this way with, you know, a small insurgent, uh, uh, an active little minority and a passive population and, and the different strategies and whatnot. And that becomes second nature. And then, of course, as all of those men and women come back to the United States, um, and many, many who, who might uh, end up working in security or police all of those techniques and know-how become uh, second nature so that, you know, the, 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 the police officers who are, say, on a, on a SWAT team are race, basically deploying the same kind of techniques right. um, that have been honed uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, the same kind of way of dealing with uh, uh, an emergency situation, with a suspect, et cetera, work in the room, uh, all of the all of the movements, all the deployments are basically uh, forms of counterinsurgency warfare, and then and then you get this kind of creation. But, the, but, there, but of course, there isn't an insurgency in this country. Uh, at least I would argue there isn't. So you have the needed fabrication of uh, an internal enemy, uh, and I think we've seen that uh, mostly uh, during the Trump administration as the kind of final uh, iteration of this uh, counterinsurgency paradigm with the creation of uh, the internal enemy. Uh, Muslims, I mean, Trump has really done so much work during his campaign and during his presidency to turn all Muslims uh, and American Muslims into an enemy, an internal enemy. Uh, and he's done the same uh, with Mexican Americans, started by calling Mexicans rapists and and with all this business about uh, the caravan, um, he's he's been able to kind of convert those into that 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 idea of an active uh, uh, insurgency that we need to repress. And I think that you you just saw it perfectly crystallized during the run up to the midterm campaign, right? right? Because I mean, it, you know, that was since Trump was just beating a drum about this caravan and how dangerous these people were and, of course, alluding to the undocumented population in this country, right? And really, I mean, it, it's as if he ran the whole uh, final stages of the midterm campaign on this counterinsurgency idea of an internal enemy. I mean, it was just uh, remarkable. And of course, after that, you 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 heard so much less about this. 
enemy, but it was clear that it was a way to control the population, right? Of course, it was a way to get people to vote, it was a, but it's also just a way to control the population. And much of the distraction mechanisms that he uses, I would say, is a way to kind of win our hearts and minds or to pacify the American population because we're spending so much time uh, following who's gotten fired and who's gotten hired and all of the palace intrigue that we really have hardly any time uh, to discuss the substantive issues. You know, when's the last time you heard someone talk about drones and drone, drone, uh, you know, what the, 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 the innocent lives that are often uh, the, the collateral consequence of drones? I mean, we don't even talk about that, even though we're using drones more right. under the Trump administration than we were under the uh, Obama administration. And the Obama administration was pretty much, a, a, you know, that, that was their trademark with drone warfare, um, but we don't even we don't even talk about it anymore because we're just so busy, distracted by, uh, you know, uh, the latest tweet and well, and the latest firing. Um, and we, we, I mean, obviously, present company uh, accepted, but <clears throat> but we do this five days a week, and so we have a little more. But yes, as a society, we're not focusing on it. I'm not convinced as a society, frankly, right. we were focusing on present it much company. during. Present there, company, exactly. right, right. Yeah. But I mean, but there I, are pockets, and you're. Right. But I'm not convinced program, that we were. Majority report is, a, is, right. is you know one of the exceptions, but we weren't you know, talking about it during the Trump during the Obama years either, though. I mean, right. t- truth be told, um, and 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 certainly there was a lot more support for the Obama administration than there was than there is at least apparently now for the Trump administration. Um, right. And so and, and, and part of that might have been, you know, a, a, a part of the dynamic coming out of, uh, you know, sort of major casualties that we were taking or, you know, d- during the Iraq war, as opposed to we're not taking any casualties uh, uh, during uh, the drone war. We're just creating casualties. Um, right. And all right, so I get the uh, and and. and you know, we've talked on this program. I think it was Charlie Savage some years ago wrote a, um, uh, a, a, a not a full length book, but uh, an extended essay on the Obama administration essentially legalizing the extrajudicial right. stuff that the Trump administration did and codifying it in our law. But right. b- but does I mean, this sticking point of creating an internal um, uh, enemy like Donald Trump, he did this with the caravan, but it, by by any measure other than uh, cable news coverage, he failed. Right. I mean, he may be succeeding to a certain extent, but we still have the majority of the country can't does not accept his premise. I mean, so what, tell me about that dynamic, because if the theory is that you must convince a passive middle one, uh, our middle's not quite as passive, it's passive, but it's not quite as passive as it may have been, frankly, during the Obama years in some respects. Um, right. and, and two, he's not doing a good job of that. Right. Mm. Yeah. So, um, so the, the, and, and this, this, this is a really important point you're making. Um, the theory is that the masses are passive uh, in counterinsurgency theory, Right. Uh, and can be swayed one way or the other, and that uh, they need to be uh, uh, pacified. Now, um, I don't, I don't believe that that is actually true mm. of society and of our society. Right? Um, we 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 tend to it gets so internalized this uh, kind of uh, counterinsurgency uh, paradigm that. Uh, it, Pretty soon, we're all starting to view the world through it. I mean, that's the that's the most dangerous thing about this way of governing is that you know um, we start to we start to take it for granted or start to believe it. For instance, we start to believe that there is an insurgency in this country. So when there are certain acts. Uh, um, and, 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 and most of the extremely violent acts these days are actually, the, the, are, 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 I would say, uh, uh, 
unstable individuals, mostly uh, lone wolf, unstable individuals who are then kind of appealing to some ideology, and, and, and most of the time now they're appealing to extreme right, uh, kind of uh, white supremacist ideology. But even you know, but and we don't and we don't factor that into this entire this whole counterinsurgency way of thinking. But when we do see acts that then do appeal to ISIS or uh, or some extreme uh, uh, fundamentalist, um, uh, you know, uh, specter uh, of Islam, um, we then start to believe that there is maybe an insurgency in this country. So one of the most uh, dangerous things about this way of governing and this whole mentality is that we start to see it, we start to believe it, we start to think that it's right. Um, particularly on this question of whether there is an insurgency, right? It's, 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 it's almost once, once the reasoning is in our mind, then it's easy to kind of project with a dart, you know, one act and say, oh, right, okay, that is the act of minority. But similarly, as you were saying, um, we, some, some start to think that maybe, you know, the, the masses or the population is passive. I, I, don't, I don't actually think it is. Um, and so when we look at um, what was a, a, a remarkable turnout for the last midterm, much more remarkable than in previous uh, episodes, uh, midterm episodes, um, I think you see actually a reflection that it, it's probably not right to be viewing the world this way, right? But, um, but it does have a way of becoming uh, the lens through which a lot of people uh, in this country start to think about uh, what's going on. Right? I, well, I mean, what, what strikes me is that um, the, you know, I mean, the, the middle, uh, to the extent that we can talk about the middle, but what we're talking about, a lot of people have sort of dubbed themselves the resistance. I mean, to, we can... To what extent they're, you know, they're resisting is is of question, but at least that's the branding, right? And that's a right. lot bigger of a cohort than the, the small insurgency. But it also occurs to me that on one hand, we are, this is, we, this resistance, as it were, may be fighting against the Trump administration, but does not seem to have a problem with the paradigm that that is existed before the Trump administration and will exist after the Trump administration, right? right? Like nobody's right. That, that, the one thing right. that we're doing is not getting rid of the uh, the AUMF. Nobody's talking right. about getting rid of the Patriot Act. Um, right. Very, I mean, the, very, all this yeah. stuff is staying is staying put essentially. Right. And yeah, and and that was the point of the, of the book. And and you were entirely right earlier to say that you know much of it was written, much of my thinking about it was written, thinking that we were going to have a Hillary Clinton administration uh, rather than a Trump administration. I mean the point of the the point of the the point of the book is that this is not this is, this is not new to Trump and what we've seen is since 9/11 the same way of governing in different flavors, okay? And we we had the Bush flavor which was torture, indefinite detention, Right, so one of the more brutal forms of counterinsurgency uh, practices, um, and total information awareness (NSA), uh, and even more, right, illicit uh, illicit uh, tapping, which was um, which was ultimately blocked by uh, by Comey. But um, uh, Ashcroft was being asked to to to, to to you know author continue to authorize illicit. Uh, but so Mueller was was, the, was infiltrating the, Muslim student groups, uh, you know, all around, right. uh, in, you know, in the CUNY, country. Right. Yeah, and yeah, I know, I know, I know. I mean, the, the NYP, the NYPD in New York City was sending an undercover agent on, you know, white water rafting trips by students here yep. uh, at the uh, city university. I mean, crazy stuff, right? That, that's right after uh, 9-11. They were, in, I if I that, remember correctly, that, they were set up in New Jersey. They were set up as far north as Connecticut, uh, yeah, northern Connecticut. So, yeah. I mean, NYPD the had this, like, had mapped, like, Newark, yep. all of Newark, with all of the different Muslim populations by nationality, maps that, like, geocoded maps, every single... You know, a little halal store. There was a picture of it with uh, a description of how many, you know, eight seats they had in the 
in the story. It was it was the it was typical. It was it was classic counterinsurgency uh, information gathering that was being done. But the important here point, and and you made it earlier, right, is that under the Obama administration, the same way of governing continued. It was again counterinsurgency. It was just of a different flavor, right? So we turned to drones. Uh, as a way to knock out that uh, insurgent uh, uh, minority uh, rather than uh, torture and uh, indefinite detention. Um, and we, we, we used different policies, but we, but we legalized uh, a lot of this as well under the Obama administration. So we legalized the idea of uh, assassinating an American citizen abroad uh, without without an, any trial or anything right i mean that's that's radical when you think about it and it, it it how contrary it is to the tradition of due process uh in this country um but that was made possible by a kind of more legalistic um but but uh, but entirely counterinsurgent uh, mode of governing under the obama administration and that's why at the beginning I was resistant to call this a state of exception because I actually call it a state of legality. We've made right. everything legal. Even these, you know, even the, even the torture, um, when you look at the torture memos that went back and forth, right, that was, it, it was all efforts to make it legal, right, to make the most illegal practice in, you know, international law legal somehow. Right, and uh, and that's what we've done pretty much over the course uh, of the past uh, almost uh, well, pretty soon it'll be two decades. Um, we've we've legalized these exceptional measures uh, associated with counterinsurgency practices. So so lastly, yeah. l- how do we how do we reverse this? How do we right. how is what is legitimate? Um, uh, resistance to this paradigm, not as it's exercised or operated by by Trump necessarily, but right. you know Robert Mueller now is like um, you know uh, is like I don't know some combination of Santa Claus and George Washington, uh, but he certainly was you know as um, a, a, an important a cog in sort of building this apparatus that you're talking about, at least domestically, in one part of it, as anybody, um, right. Barack Obama, you know, put it into a legal framework in many respects. That's what, um, I mean, much of his project was. Some of it uh, was discarded, but, but, but the vast majority of it was, was sort of legalized. What, how do we, um, what's the, the, the plan to, to, uh, to change this. Right. right. Well, um, I would say that the first thing we need to do is understand the continuities and understand the underlying logic of the way we're governing today. Uh, and that's the project of the book. I mean, in other words, to make people understand that, you know, the the Bush administration is, is instantiating a, a new a new variation on this theme, uh, but isn't unique in this way. And that many of the kind of forces uh, from the uh, middle uh, actually have in the past and continue to uh, support this counterinsurgency way of governing. Uh, And so I think we need to take a, we need to take a step back uh, and to, of course, I mean, uh, it's it's hard to, given the intensity of uh, of some of the of some of these policies that uh, Trump has put in place, because you, you're just battling against, you know, the the the, the immigration policies, et cetera. So so you're so focused on these particular uh, policies, like the Muslim ban or the you know a ban on asylums, et cetera. Um, but I think that. We need to, you know, we need to struggle against those radical uh, policies, but we also need to take a step back and see that it's not simply going back to those policies of uh, of kind of sanitized or 
legalized counterinsurgency that is really going to move us uh, into a, a political space where we want, where we really want to be, right? Yeah. Uh, and so one thing is uh, awareness and raising these issues and talking about them, uh, and then the other is putting in place a, a more uh, probably a more a radical uh, a, approach uh, that not only challenges uh, Trump's uh, excesses but also challenges the regularity uh, of what we've seen uh, in terms of counterinsurgency policies. That also challenges our, our foreign policy, the, use, the continued use of drones ab- abroad, um, and that also tries to demilitarize uh, our police forces in this country and, uh, and bring us back to uh, more of a uh, uh, c- community-oriented way of thinking about how we uh, govern our shared spaces. Bernard Harcourt, the book is The Counter-Revolution, How Our Government Went to War Against Its Own Citizens. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Sam. Talk Bye. to you Bye-bye. soon. Hope again. Bye-bye. All right, folks. We will put a link, uh, obviously, to the counter-revolution, how our government went to war against its own citizens at uh, majority.fm for your reading pleasure. Well, really, your clicking pleasure, and then the reading pleasure is, you know, once. We're trying to facilitate your reading pleasure by providing you clicking pleasure, is the way I would put it. You know, uh, one of the biographies I wrote once upon a time when I was a staff writer at a biography publication was of Doug Fife, who created Oof. a lot of the legal framework for torture uh, during the Bush two administration. And I actually got a pissed off letter from him because he had found it and it made him mad. So did you say that letter? I don't think I have it anymore. Oh, my God. If we had a nickel for every time we say uh, Doug Fife's name, uh, he was in. The uh, the DOD had set up their own sort of like rival intelligence shop, I think, in the basement of the Pentagon. Right. And he uh, because it was basically to put institutional pressure on the CIA to to come back with material that said that um, Iraq was involved in 9-11. And so, look, competition breaks out uh, and, uh, you you know, the, the marketplace in this instance, the one client was Dick Cheney. The marketplace wants this uh, intelligence. Competition would start kicking in. And uh, competition kicked in, and they got what they want, more or less. And to the extent that they didn't get what they wanted, they just made sure that it was what they wanted. Innovation. Innovation. You have to break some things. So, and here we are. Um, Folks, a reminder, this program cannot and does not exist but for the help of its members. Some of you hear my voice and your members. And this, this call lands on, on your ears as if it's sort of like a, almost like a lullaby. You feel so at home because you've already, you have already become a member. So it creates no anxiety. For those of you who are not members, the, the, the sound of my voice right now creates a tremendous amount of anxiety. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> because you have not become a member by going to jointhemajorityreport.com and for just a couple bucks a week, uh, you can support this show on a daily basis and all our plans for the coming new year. Now, look, oh, I forgot to say this. You guys got to remind me to say this at the beginning of the show. We need your suggestions for best ofs, best of Uh, If there's like a YouTube clip or something that you saw or a funny segment or an interview, send us an email at majorityreporters at gmail.com. Put best of in the subject line. Best of. The word best. Second word of. O-F. And help us out. What do you think was the funniest thing that happened this year? What do you think was the funniest thing? What was the saddest thing that happened? What was the... The most WTF. The most like, yeah, WTF-ish thing. The most, uh, what, was the, what was the most Michael-ish moment <laughs> that we had on the show, for instance? I can say that. He's not here today, so. And maybe that's it. Um, also, 
JustCoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate, thirty percent off. I think for a couple more days. Now is the time, folks. If you ever want to try just coffee, now is the time. To try it. Check out different blends, whatever. Thirty percent off, free shipping. It's tremendous. Now, listen. I don't want to freak you out again, but there is now. We are now in the double digits of tickets left. At one point, we had almost four hundred tickets available for the January 10th, excuse me, 13th show. We didn't uh, add a second one. Uh, January 13th show at the Bell House, live, majority report. Maybe we'll have a guest, maybe we won't. It will just be all of us. Uh, maybe it will be a guest, I don't know. But um, we're now in double digits, actually well into double digits. Well below triple digits, let's put it that way. I don't know how to express it. Closer to zero than 100. So in other words, you better do it now. I sort of lied to you. I said maybe it'll sell out by the end of the year. And now it looks like it's going to sell out by before Christmas and maybe even before the solstice. The solstice. Wow. That's, that, that bodes well, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Check my charts. Definitely. So uh, it's 15 bucks. Maybe that's why. Super cheap. And it's 18 and over. Maybe that's why. Because we get all those 19-year-olds who've been pounding down the doors to see the majority report live. But um, we're working on all sorts of crazy-ass stuff. And um, just got something in the mail that uh, may force us to uh, make an announcement. I don't know. We'll see. You guys didn't see it. No. But it's sitting there on the couch. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's strange. Um, all right, so uh, I check that out. And um, don't forget, uh, tomorrow night, uh, Michael will be back, undoubtedly, because tomorrow's his show. He never misses that show, does he? It's very healthy on Tuesdays. It's very weird. <laughs> we should always just tell him, today's Tuesday, what are you doing? Um, I'm not sure who he has as a guest uh, tomorrow night. But Matt Taibbi. Oh, Matt Taibbi is in studio. Matt Taibbi is also very uh, worried about getting sick. So we'll see if he shows <laughs> very, very health conscien uh, conscious. Um, so uh, check out uh, TMBS. You can find it on any uh, place your podcast is served or on the TMBS YouTube channel. Jamie? Jamie's yeah, here. Here I am. Well, last week you were sick. I'm still sick, but I'm here anyway. You got to do something about your health. Yeah. You need like <laughs> a body transplant or something. I don't know. Well, Maybe just like quit a few of my jobs. I don't know. Not this one. This one pays me the best. But uh, yeah, uh, this week on the Antifada, we still have our last week's episode out where we recap our trip to Mexico, including uh, me and Sean's visit to an autonomous Zapatista community and the amazing libertarian socialist society that they have there um also this past weekend we recorded an episode that'll be out on wednesday with justin Akers chacon author of radicals in the barrio magonistas socialists wobblies and communists in the mexican-american working class and uh it was really inspired by the bad immigration take by angela nagel that people were getting mad about but this is actually a topic i've been wanting to do for a while so i'm really glad we got to do it and show how the criminalization of migration actually benefits uh, the capitalist class more than anyone. There you go. A new literary hangover this week. It's a nonfiction one for those of you who don't like the uh, fiction focus. Um, it's on uh, Nancy McLean's uh, Democracy in Chains. We get into which sort of the long history of capital versus democracy and, uh, and how libertarians have sort of played into that. And I also get into some of the controversy around it, like such as... Uh, I think uncharitable, I think we could call it quotation um, by Nancy McLean, although I, I think it's defensible in, in uh, a certain number of cases that I looked at. So uh, if you've been curious about that book, we kind of go through it uh, fairly in depth. It's about 90 minutes long. So check that wow, out. There you go. All right, folks. Did you see this? Someone just tweeted me. Did you know this? I did not know this. Um, that uh, Pamela Anderson is in a, has been in a, is this true? She's been in a, uh, a year and a half long romantic relationship with Julian Assange. Oh yeah. No, I didn't know. No, I had no I idea. I used to be it. a gossip blogger, and I had to keep track of these things. Why didn't you tell us? Did it just come up when I you were? I just thought it was common knowledge. 
<laughs> I feel like we've no talked idea. about it before, no? No. She's like Antifa now. She's been tweeting some very... Well, uh, no, I've been reading some of her, her why tweets. Why still with Assange? She's pretty uh, sophisticated, but... Um, I'm sure she'll move beyond him soon. Yeah, she's got to graduate beyond yeah, him. Yeah, that makes me a little bit uh, leery of... Uh, I mean... Oh, maybe she'll come on Antifada. We can uh, talk about it. We can have a little girl-to-girl we'll girl talk Pam about her romantic choices. Pamela Anderson goes in the black block. Hell yeah. Um, there you go. All right. Well, we're going to take a quick break. Head back. Fun half. 646-257-3920. See you then. <laughs> We are back. It is the fun half, ladies and gentlemen. It is Monday. Oh, gosh. I forgot to do this. I'm going to have to cut this into the... Um, the yep. Uh, just reminder. Calming Comfort by Sharper Image is the luxurious weighted blanket that mimics the soothing feeling of being hugged. So you can now sleep better, feel great, and stress less. Common Comfort Weighted Blanket comes with a 90-day anxiety-free, stress-free. Best night's sleep of your life, guaranteed from Sharper Image. And right now, for our listeners, you can go to CalmingComfortBlanket.com, all one word, CalmingComfortBlanket.com. Use the promo code MAJORITY at checkout to receive 15% off the displayed price. Again, that's CalmingComfortBlanket.com, promo code majority because you can't put a price on a great night's sleep. Uh, right now, folks, there's been, um, as you know, in, um, in Poland, there has been a, a climate change uh, summit. COP24 is what they call it. What is it? Uh, climate, um, I, I can't remember what it stands for. Uh, it's in Poland. Um, not sure what the theory was doing it in Poland. I think they were sort of pushing coal a little bit <laughs> as a uh, country, but maybe that's part of the reason you take it into the sort of the belly of the beast. There was um, a massive protest. Hundreds of 
frontline leaders and U.S. youth just completely took over the Trump administration's farcical clean fossil fuels panel at COP24 and then walked out. Here's the room before the action. As you can see, a ton of people in there, a lot of immediate. And then after the action, virtually all empty, uh, but for the media. And here's a video of that last movement uh, a moment during the Trump administration's side event, I guess it was, at uh, COP24, where protesters interrupted to urge the panel to essentially um, not dig up any more fossil fuels. There you go. So I guess they started off by basically as a group just starting to laugh hysterically at what the um, uh, the Trump administration was presenting in terms of the clean coal technology. It's a good bit. And uh, and then um, moments after that, they they walked out. I'm sure um, Tucker Carlson's going to do a half hour on. on Where's how, the civility? Listen to what they have to say. Yeah. Why? Why? Why are you afraid of clean coal technology? It says clean coal. What more do you want? That's why I think this is disingenuous. And all they want to do is make everything socialist. Can never make them happy. Do you really want to drive in a, in a, in a horse and buggy? How did these people get to Poland? Yeah. I wonder, how did they get to Poland? They take a steamship? What? Or what? A, a, a nuclear-powered steamship? Or a solar-powered wind boat? No, they all flew. With their iPhones, probably. That is uh, just, I, I actually think we could probably put a bet down on that. Yeah. See They're if trade, very predictable. See if trade sports is offering, uh, uh, does that still around or uh, predict it? It's, it's a different one now. Is it predict it? Go see if predict it has what the odds is that Tucker Carlson says something to the effect that they flew. Those protesters flew there. With jet fuel. How dare they? Let's go to the phones. You're calling from a 315 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Uh, hello. Um, can't believe I actually got on. Uh, my name is Michael. I'm from Austin, Texas, but the area code is actually uh, upstate New York. Well, uh, Michael, that is uh, TMI, but, um, uh, but if you're in Austin, oh, Texas, sorry, sorry. that's fine. Do you live in Austin, Texas, okay, uh, or are you just visiting? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, okay. I'm actually from Texas originally, but I, I was in the military, so I was stationed near Syracuse, and I went to school up there afterwards. So. Okay. okay, good enough. All right, so you're uh, Michael from Texas, from Austin. Uh, yes, sir. What's on your mind? Um, so I didn't get the entire interview. I caught, uh, I guess, most of the second half. Uh, I guess you had Colin. Yeah. And, uh, so I'm prior military, I'm a combat veteran and, you know, he was talking about the, uh, you know, kind of the militarization of the police. And I have to say, even as a veteran, like I, I really agree with it. Like, I'm, I mean, I'm kind of against, well, I'm very much against it. And I see a lot of my uh, friends that went to work for the police afterwards and they have kind of like that occupation mindset mm. and it's just. To be perfectly honest, I'm not so sure that the military background is the best thing for police departments. And uh, I, I think if, I mean, I, I've always had the idea, I think, you know, community uh, policing is important. And there needs to be a, like an emphasis on maybe police getting a degree in social work or something along those lines. Right. But, uh, I, I, yeah, I'm just very much against it, uh, the militarization of it. Um. 
I, I mean, I think on, on some level, I certainly, I, I mean, I totally get what you're saying here, right? You come with a certain uh, mentality. You've been trained in a, for a certain environment and that environment does not exist in our cities in the United States. Uh, yet it's very hard if you are, you know, in some respects, uh, not, not quite geared up, but some ways uh, geared up in the same way that you were in the military to react to to react to everyone around you in the same way that you would have in that situation. But but be just a little bit more explicit from your perspective if you're comfortable doing so. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm a bit nervous. So. Um, so you, you see a lot of like this, you know, like thin blue line, all this kind of nonsense, and it. Just again, I, I think that people, explicitly, you know, people that were, you know, in combat arms within the military tend to have the mindset of, you know, like an occupying force. I mean, and I think they carry that over to the police. Um, and I think it's just, it's bad for everyone. It's bad for the community. Uh, what does that mentality look like? The, the, the mentality of uh, we're an occupying force. Okay, so I would have to say... And again, sound a bit nervous. So no, no, no worries. This very well. You sound great. Okay, so if you're like someone who's an infantry, like myself, uh, you know, you go out every day on deployment, and no matter what you're doing, even if it's like counterinsurgency operations, which is what I largely did, you know, you're always, you know, you, you suspect everyone's up to no good. Um, you you don't really trust anyone, and you know, you're trained, you know, to engage and kill if need be. And I feel like I, I just, I've seen so many people make the transition uh, from that environment to the police and they kind of have that same attitude. Right. Um, you know, they, they are more of an occupying force. They're not there to help so much. If that makes sense. Makes total sense. I mean, there's a, there's a fascinating book that um, uh, Chris Hayes wrote about, um, that is that that runs parallel to this, a colony and a nation, that uh, specifically talks about the way that um, uh, his theory about the way that uh, essentially black people experience the police in this country uh, versus the way that white people do. Obviously, you know these are um, uh, you know broadly speaking, he's talking about these things, um, and. Um, the, the mentality is that some people are, you know, the police are there to protect and serve. And uh, in others, the police are there to control and um, and uh, sort of um, uh, sequester. And and certainly the the influx of people who have been trained with that's what their mentality uh, is supposed to do in this role is is. I would imagine, at the very least, um, enhancing it society wide. Yeah, it's a problem. It is. It's a, it's a big problem. Yeah, absolutely. We shouldn't have. Yeah, and we shouldn't have, frankly, a military that has that type of experience. <laughs> yeah, that's the only thing I was no, going to no, add. No, no, I agree. Like people, um, people shouldn't be subject to those. Right. People shouldn't be subject to those kinds of occupying methods anywhere. Yes. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, it just takes away completely from the idea of community policing, which is the only way to effectively police, if you ask me. Um, especially, like, if you're working in a city or a county where you're not even from. It's just, it's just a recipe for disaster, and I think that's a lot of what we're seeing. Yeah. Michael, I appreciate the phone call. Thanks for calling, man. Okay, uh, thank you. And so I was uh, kind of nervous. I was driving as well, so it was kind of caught me off guard. Thank you so much. Yeah, you did great. Thanks, show. man. Thanks. Thank you. Colin from an 847 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Sam, it's Josh in Chicago. Josh in Chicago. What is on uh, your mind? I'm not in Chicago. <laughs> Pulling the same thing that Michael just did. Where are you, Josh, if you don't mind us telling? Um, I'm in a room. All right. Fair enough. Josh, in a room. What's on your mind, Josh? Uh, first of all, Sam, Jamie, Pamela Anderson is dating French footballer Adil Rami. Like, come on, people. Did she move on but, or is she dating two guys What's right going now? on? I, you know, I, 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 That's why she lives in France. 
I am not as heavily invested in Pamela Anderson as people seem to think that I was because we exclaimed that um, she had set out a bunch of tweets that I thought were fairly sophisticated and interesting, period. Oh, yeah. And, and, I, and I got a little bit of pushback because, like, well, why, why is that a surprise to you? Because she's, uh, you know, uh, blonde. Uh, and, but no, it's, here's, 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 here's why it was surprising to me. <clears throat> in the main, in the main, my experience of people who make their money and their fame and their acclaim from wearing a bathing suit on a TV show that I wouldn't be able to sit and watch for four minutes, five minutes, do not show up articulating um, really smart analysis of of some uh, you know international political questions. And I, I mean, I, if Joey from Friends, whatever that dude's name is, uh, came out and said it, I would ex- I would register the exact same. Like, wow, I had no idea. Yeah. Um, if. Uh, I mean, I mean, I feel like we've done that with sports figures where like, uh, what's it? Yeah, Van Gundy? Is it uh, not Van Gundy? Popovich. Yeah, Popovich. Like I had no idea. And I'm impressed by oh, that guy used to be on the pa- Patriots. Martellus. Um, Martellus Bennett. Yeah. Um, or uh, Dante Stallworth. Dante yeah, Stallworth. I mean, these are examples. So you of should people. have on your program. I'm not saying that they, that, that you know, was, was athletes or, you know, entertainers can't have good take that would be it's like uh, wow uh, well she, i'm not terribly surprised by uh, the ability for entertainers it's just that uh you know uh you develop a bias against um you know yeah. it's, a, it's a predisposition i'm not biased against it i'm completely open to it but i didn't expect it well she's all. also been all over the map in terms of her politics and her views i have not i have not followed her oh, politics views but um, oh she used to date kid rock yeah. Ooh, well, <laughs> I mean, the heart. Let me put it this way, Josh. Uh, the heart wants what it wants, and there's uh, nothing we can. Oh, do Oh, Sam, about. I know this. I know this. Yeah, no, I know, I know you know. Um, that, anyways, I, I wanted to uh, talk about. You guys talked about uh, the whole bait controversy uh, the other day uh, with uh, people trying Sanders people, people like me trying to prevent Beto O'Rourke from running. Um, and I, I guess I just wanted to, to comment on this, although you guys said it pretty succinctly. Um, there was a, an, you know, our friend Neera Tandon had a tweet uh, the other day where she said, uh, why would any progressives be protesting a carbon tax? And then uh, I think a, uh, someone who was a, someone responded to, I think he said he's a truck driver. And he said, basically the way to, um, the way to solve global warming isn't by hurting the poor essentially. And, uh, lowering taxes on the super rich, which is what Macron has done. And so I think, um, from my perspective, you see a lot of these people who are um, essentially using these, like, I don't want to say, it's not even identity politics. They're using these sort of, their centrist politics that they just don't agree with Bernie Sanders. And so they aren't even bringing up people like Stacey Abrams to run, who is way more progressive than Beto, like, there's no question she's more progressive or even like Andrew Gillum, who's actually like very progressive. They like just have fundamental like disagreements with Bernie Sanders. They think someone like Emmanuel Macron is the future and is how we should address things like climate change or even things like income inequality. And so I think that's sort of what's going on. And I it's important not to take the bait in a way and almost yeah. not to get into arguments with these people because they're, they're just sort of full of shit. Well, that's the thing is that I think, I, I think, look, there's, um, it's 2016 is different than 2018. 2020 is going to be different than 2016. And there's a difference between being an insurgent candidate and being the one that has got, got the most popularity. There is a difference between being, the uh, a candidate who entered the race um, thinking that he was going to run on a uh, issue uh, an issue campaign that was really more about highlighting an issue versus trying to win a campaign and the same level of 
defensiveness by Bernie supporters uh, that may have been appropriate in 2016 is not necessarily appropriate today. There is, I tend to think, for the most part, that Neera Tandon's audience has seriously shrunken. And that yeah. um, that it is far more relevant and there's far more ability, frankly, for people to educate people about uh, Beto, um, maybe to his detriment, maybe to his benefit, uh, then okay. then it, it's far more uh, opportunity to do that than to win in a Twitter uh, snaps contest with near Tandon. That that is my that is my opinion. I mean, look, I remember six months ago, seven months ago, saying, look. Beto may win, but people should just be prepared. He's not as progressive. Phase as, ahead by. Yeah, he's just not. As, and which is fine. You know, uh, the upgrade from uh, Ted Cruz would have been beyond dramatic. And uh, the the notion of that state um, having a Democratic senator after I think the Lloyd, last one was like Lloyd Benson. Um, Lloyd Benson, yeah. Was, would have been great. And so... Um, but yeah, I think there might be some truth to what you're saying about Stacey Abrams and Andrew Gillum. I I just haven't heard. I don't get the sense that they are done with state politics. I think they know. No. Th- there's a lot more opportunity for yeah, them in right. their respective states than there is for Beto, and I think that's why you know, I mean that's why Mike Pence jumped to uh, from a an incredibly unpopular governor in Indiana. And he took the, the the VP thing because, you know, A, God told him, B, God told him, yeah, and C, a... God told him, like, your your ratings in Indiana suck. You're done. You're done. So, But Bernie is still an insurgent candidate. I mean, yes. I, I and guess the mainstream would, media degree, has two been degree. doing everything they can still to marginalize him and make him look crazy and his supporters and the things that he wants. He's and in, it's our job, like, if you're in you alternative think, media, to say, no, those things are actually quite reasonable. Yeah, he's he's an insurgent candidate in, 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 the, in, the, in the broader context. But I'm saying that his candidacy is not the long shot uh, and the... Uh, the David versus the Goliath that it was in 2016. I mean, I think that's just the the, the case. Um, Yeah. Centrist Democrats are starting to come to him like with like their policies, like they're starting to meet him. And so they're just now starting to talk about Medicare for all. Right. Well, well, this is why they have to be duplicitous in what they're actual arguing about. Right. They, they say like, leave Beto alone. Like there's plenty of time for him to be, uh, you know, more specific on about his bold policy agenda later. But no, there isn't. Right, exactly. Like, all well, the other no. candidates. Well, are that's doing the that. point. Even even that's the, even Booker's done stuff. This is called a campaign, right? And like, just as um, you know, the uh, just as like when people were like they they screwed over um, Keith Ellison by running Tom Perez. Well, it's it's an election. <laughs> it's a campaign. Like that is actually the only legitimate thing that they should be doing putting up their candidate. And if your candidate is dilly dallying and hasn't entered the race or hasn't, doesn't have, you know, proposals out in front, then guess what? Tell them to get them. There's a reason Booker came out with the baby bonds. Thing. Exactly. They've been doing this for two or three years. Those guys, I don't know if it's going to be effective, but that's what a, a campaign is. And so, uh, like how, how could you attack Bet? Like, why? There's 30 people running. Why shouldn't be people? We should be attacking everybody right now to clear the field for everybody. It's too many candidates. They should all be attacked, so that um, you know they they all clear the uh, the playing field. But you know when they're when they're when they're crying about policy, I mean process in this situation. And I said the same thing about when Bernie was talking too much about process in March of 2016. When they're talking about process. You just keep doing substance because no one cares about process. This is not being bag. This is not being bag. Yep. All right. Appreciate the call, Josh. It's not. It's not. It's not being bag. More wisdom from Jeb. He still gives. That's the thing about the bushes. Even in this. Tough this time. is being bag. 
even in this tough this time. is not beanbag this is beanbag that would have been a really good show if we'd spun that off of like a short 10 minute game show of is it beanbag or is it not beanbag? that would have been great uh i need another sound sheet i've lost mine i think i've already um Get this guy going up here. The IM's uh, rolling. I don't have too much uh, time today, folks. Um, let me show you how the leader of the free world, <laughs> free-ish world, the leader-ish of the free-ish world, who, I mean, let's be honest. We can dispute and find annoyance at the term leader of the free world, right? That is, I think we can all agree that that's, a, that's an annoying uh, construct. But I think what we can also all agree on is the idea that this guy, the president of the United States, has at his fingertips, really at his every whim, the, um, all the possible resources you could want to engage in politics, Right. Hey, I read this book. Get me that guy to come explain it to me. I mean, that's sort of what I do on this show. But I get, you know, like I, I get a. It's a much harder process. We can get them to. We get. If I was the president of the United States, we could have everybody come in studio. Yeah, and they'd feel patriotic about it. That's right. It wouldn't be like, oh, I'll just get on the phone with this dude. Um. And you theoretically have all sorts of legal counsel and and whatnot. So what would you do if you had all of those assets at your fingertips when you wanted to make a point? Well, of course, you would turn on the TV. And when you did, you would see Fox News morning guys and gals. The time now is 39 minutes after the hour. Democrats can't find their smoking gun to tie the Trump campaign to Russia after James Comey's testimony. All right. So what about all the talk of collusion? Will this have any impact? We debate that coming up next. Now, I love how they frame this. Democrats can't get their smoking gum for the testimony that James Comey was required to give by the Republicans who didn't they didn't want any. What? Um, so that was uh, 39 past the hour. 39 past the hour. That's uh, as a, a former radio guy. That's what you would say if you knew that you were uh, uh, on across the country. Say 39 past the hour because I may be in New York, but. When we did the majority report on Air America, we also had an L.A. affiliate. So I would say 10 past the hour, quarter past the hour. You do that on Fox News, too. What happened at 46 past the hour? For those of you um, who are uh, who are uh, big fans of Trump, uh, 46, seven minutes later, seven minutes later than 39 past the hour. At 46 past the hour this morning, Donald Trump. Tweeted out, Democrats can't find a smocking gun. Tying the Trump campaign to Russia after James Comey testimony. No smocking gun. No collusion. Fox News. That's because there was no collusion. So now the Dems go to a simple private transaction, wrongly calling it a campaign contribution. Well, first off, it's smoking gun. There was definitely no smocking gun. That's not a spelling mistake I've ever made before, but... Well, it's not a spelling mistake you've made before twice. Yeah. You got to wonder, like, what was going on. That feels to me like a cut and paste job. They hacked my autocorrect. That feels like a, a cut and paste job because y you'll notice there is no, no C near, like, I don't know what, like, how do you add an extra letter? Uh, how do you add an extra letter? If you think it's, like, choking... Well, I, it's one thing if it was like if the word was smoking gun and you're like, oh, I hit I hit C instead of the second O yeah. because they're across. But this is as if you actually believed that the word smoking was spelled S-M-O-C-K. I mean, it rhymes with choking. Yeah, that was not a typo. Smoking, folks. choking. Not a typo. Not a typo. Because Trump likes to use the word. Wait. Uh, and so he goes on and he's talking about the uh, campaign contribution now. Be clear, the Dems haven't done anything. The Southern District of New York is a fully uh, independent of any political party 
uh, U.S. Attorney's Office, they are also about as independent from the Department of Justice as you can get. And they called it a felonious campaign contribution, a felony, that was directed by Donald Trump. But he goes on to say, which it was not. But even if it was, it's only a civil case like Obama's. But it was done correctly by a lawyer and there would not even be a fine. Lawyer's liability if he made the mistake, not me. <laughs> <laughs> that's, his, that's his whole mood. Cohen just trying to get his sentence reduced. Which? Hunt. There you go. So Donald Trump getting his news from, from Fox News in the morning and not knowing how to spell smoking, even though it was on the Chiron, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. It was. That's, That's pretty embarrassing. Yeah. That's pretty embarrassing. Good um, thing he can't be embarrassed. That's true. He is utterly shameproof. I've, I've got a defense. I've got a defense. Um, I don't know if I can play that Kevin McCarthy stuff because I, I find it too nauseating. Uh, let's look at the IMs for a moment. Gabe from Chicago. Best of clips have to include Ronald Reagan calling in as dumb, dumb John from San Antonio. Will you uh, put that? <laughs> That's pretty good. I almost crashed my car laughing. That was from the Halloween show. That was pretty good. That was pretty good. Um, I don't know what's more disgusting. Watching Kevin McCarthy pretend that none of the past 10 years have happened or watching Chuck Todd legitimately act as if he's been completely unaware of what's happened over the past, let's say, 10, 5, 10 weeks, 10 minutes, 10 hours, 10 days, the past 10 days, let's say. Here is Tony Evers. Tony Evers was elected governor of Wisconsin. Um... You will recall uh, he ousted uh, Scott Walker. You will recall that when Scott Walker came in on a pledge not to uh, destroy unions in Wisconsin, he went ahead and destroyed uh, unions' uh, ability to negotiate public sector unions in Wisconsin. Uh, he also got rid of, I think, Badger Care at the time. And um, went on to appoint uh, Supreme Court justices in the... Um, Wisconsin, who would okay his uh, program, uh, et cetera, et cetera. As you know, the Wisconsin state legislature has severely curtailed um, the incoming governor's powers, enhanced the Republicans' powers, um, hurt uh, access to the vote in a myriad of ways. Um, and so how would you respond to this if you had Tony Evers here? What are you going to do to get this back? Um, how you must be incredibly outraged. This is one of the most anti-democratic things I've ever seen. Remember, remember now, folks, on a federal level, Mitch McConnell would go on this program and say, look, we can't allow Barack Obama to have an, a choice on the Supreme Court because we're a year out from when his replacement will be seated. We're 10 months out from an election. Compare and contrast when someone has their, the entire system of government in Wisconsin is altered during the lame duck session because they lost. But, so I'm not uh, particularly encouraged uh, at this okay. point in time, but it's, a, it's around Scott Walker's legacy. He, he has the opportunity to uh, uh, change this and actually validate the, uh, the will of the people that, uh, that voted on November 6th. Did you negotiate with him? Did you say, you know what, look, I know X is really important to you, I get that, but what's with Y and Z here? Was there a Y and Z? Did you go to him and say, look, I... I, I I really think this part is just crazy. Please veto that. If you want to keep this, I get it. No, I, I, I talked about a few areas that are really important that actually Republican business leaders have talked about that, that would take away power and impl implicate uh, and, and make, a, make uh, economic development much more difficult in the state of Wisconsin. But the, the entire thing is a mess. It's a hot mess. And uh, uh, I, I believe that he should veto the entire package. In fact, f the, at least three or four of the 
pieces that are in there now he has vetoed uh, previously and so it makes no sense to me and you know he's he's been a long time public servant yeah. and and I am and he 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 has a legacy here so we're, we're hopeful that he will veto the whole thing I'm curious after you were elected and quickly we heard word that the Republican speaker and the Republican majority leader uh, in in the legislature there were considering these bills um, did you reach out to them personally <laughs> Um, before the bill started going, and, and, and if you did, what was that conversation like? Well, I, I met with uh, uh, Robin Voss, the, the speaker, uh, much before those words came, uh, the, that rumor came down the, the pike. No, I, I haven't had a chance to talk. I mean, it was last minute. It was one of these, uh, uh, here's the rumor, and then here's the, here's the bills that have been worked on for several months. But, you know, Chuck, if Scott Walker so had didn't... won this election, if Scott Walker had won this election, we wouldn't be sitting here talking to you today. Is there any part, you know, one of the things that the speaker said, he goes, well, in hindsight, maybe we gave the governor too much power. Take the partisan hat off a minute. All right. I know oh that, that, that perhaps many people read that comment. Pause it for one second. Okay. Let, just let me contemplate this. All right. The voters of Wisconsin have voted out these people. So the first suggestion and the second suggestion by Chuck Todd is. But did you have like a man-to-man -man conversation with these guys and say, hey, come on, guys, what are you doing this for? Come on, come on. Look, I'll give you a little bit of this. You give me a little bit of that. As if like what the voters voted on was not, was not enough. Right? That the obligation is you because you just won the election. So, of course, you need to placate the people who did not just win the election. I mean, this is just, uh, it, it, there's a pathology here. There's a pathology. You would never, never see this in the reverse. Yeah, and never. nothing he did would placate them regardless. Of course it not. It goes exactly. without they saying. They would laugh at him. They would laugh at him. I brought you a, a bag lunch. We can hey, hash this out. Hey, hey. How about some of those uh, cheese things that we're so fr we're famous for around Brought here? Brought some LaCroix. Yeah, no. what are those um, those uh, cheese nubs? What are those, uh, the cheese nuts? Curds. Cheese curds. Yeah. I That's you, Wisconsin. I brought you some cheese curds. That might be what Chuck Schumer would tell him to do, but uh, probably not the best idea. Le uh, Tony Evers, I know you just won the election. Do you ever think about going over there and bringing some coffee? Just bringing him a cup of coffee and here's some donuts and just being the nice guy in the office. Let's see what else now. He, now, now he's now, now we're, we go back a little bit because now he's like really starting to go like, well, maybe you really dropped the ball here. Maybe you if really Scott Walker had won this election. We wouldn't be sitting here talking to you today. Is there any part, you know, one of the things that the speaker said, he goes, well, in hindsight, maybe we gave the governor too much power. Take the partisan hat off a minute. All right. I know that that, that perhaps many people read that comment tongue in cheek. But do you believe he's right? Well, there are things in that bill that really had nothing to do with giving Scott Walker anything. So, no, I, I don't agree with that. Uh, you know, we, we have balanced power in the state of Wisconsin. The you know, legislature on both sides are Republican. I'm a Democrat. The attorney general is a Democrat. No, I, I, I view this as completely different than what uh, Robin Voss believes. That, and that is that it, we are trying to invalidate the, the will of the people. The people of Wisconsin didn't voted for me because they knew that I was for good schools and, and good transportation system and good health care uh, they didn't they didn't uh, they didn't elect me to fight over uh, uh, administrative powers in the in in the state of Wisconsin vis-a-vis -vis the Republican majority no I, th I think this 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 gets us off to a bad start and I, I, I think it's a, a mistake but uh, we will continue working to get the people of Wisconsin to convince Scott Walker to think about his legacy and make sure that uh, he vetoes this language Democratic Congresswoman Gwen Moore said the following, the legislatures who engineered this coup, their actions amount to a smash and grab hijacking of the voters' will. You think coup's the right word here? 
Oh my God! Well, it's it's always uh, it seems it seems strong, but the the fact of the matter is, uh, uh, as I just said, if Scott Walker had won this election and he did not, I did, we wouldn't be sitting here talking about this today. We we wouldn't th we wouldn't be talking. Uh, Scott Walker wouldn't be sitting here talking about. Geez, they're they're trying to they're trying to balance the power here. So no, I I think it is, is you know it's directly related to to a win. By a Democrat, and that be me, right. and uh, and we 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 need to we need to have this in, we need to have this vetoed. One of their rationales. Pause. I just think the the line of questioning here is just. St I mean, but but honestly, let me give you a chance. There is a uh, there's a congresswoman uh, from uh, Wisconsin. She's black, and she said the word coup. Don't you think that's going too far? Don't you think that's going too far? Not the problem with, let's say, we're going to shut down um, the majority of early voting. Not the problem with, say, that we're going to strip the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, the, the Democrat who, who won uh, the governorship uh, of powers in terms of, like, uh, the business roundtable. Not because we're going to limit your capacity. Not because we've taken the Secretary of State, who used to have a staff of 50, of 50 people, to work on elections, not because we took that guy and put him in the basement of the state house with one employee. But she said the word coup. Don't we need to bring the rhetoric down? I mean, this is just, I mean, it is, that is a pathology. Like, look at what they're actually doing. Look at what they're actually doing in that state house. Look at what they're doing in Michigan. But there is, a, is a coup the exact word that you'd want to use to describe it? Can we spend more time on this? Can we do like a, a coup? Make sure we're getting the tone right. Yeah, I mean, are we, are we, what they're doing is blank, okay? And that's a negative blank. But isn't what's important is that we describe it in such a way that isn't too offensive to anybody? Isn't that what's really important? have this in that we need to have this vetoed one of their rationales has been well governor-elect evers margins all came from two cities madison and milwaukee uh we have to represent the rest of the state what do you say to that charge and more importantly you want a very narrow election how do you reach across how do you reach across this divided state at this point Why well, pause it, it. Was, are you effing kidding me are you kidding me? The reflectiveness is just bizarre. How do you reach across the state? Oh, I know. How about not during the lame duck session? We don't try and strip me of all my power. Is that one way to reach across the aisle? God. Are you kidding Maybe the all-time bad Chuck Todd clip. This is, but I got news for you folks. There'll be coming day. And I don't know if it'll be in two years, or six years, or, you know, in three weeks when Donald Trump will not be president. Maybe it'll be because he just can't take it anymore. Maybe his heart will give out. Maybe he'll lose an election. Or lose it. Generally, maybe he'll that I that I don't think has kept anybody out of office. Maybe he'll he will, you know, he will uh, serve out uh, two terms. But if one day there will be no Donald Trump. And you're going to expect. That the media is going to understand what just happened and how he was enabled by the darling Paul Ryan. And the. The old institutionalist Mitch McConnell and et cetera, et cetera. And you're going to think, ah, oh, the media, they know better now. I want you to go back and look at that clip over and over again until you realize they don't, they won't. There is, there is going to be no moment where you can say like, glad that passed. Now everything's going to be better than normal. Eh, no. 
and also you, you should also understand if you're one of those people who've only recently engaged in, uh, in politics, this type of cra uh, crap has been going on for at least two decades, at least. It may have been worse during the Bush administration. Probably worse because, you know, George Bush was not was was part of the the elite and was much more well behaved than Donald Trump. Born again, except for I mean, except for the. Except for the killing of the hundreds of thousands of people, aside from that part, much better behaved. You know, they say it's not it's not the war of choice that kills the hundreds of thousands of people. It's the manners that counts. Right. So. Oh, man, I don't think I'm going to be able to take it. I really don't think I'm going to be able to take it. You just can't. No. Can't even. Um, look. We need to be sensitive to the fact that there are a lot of folks out there who feel like they're getting a raw deal right now. They're not getting the credit they deserve that there's people basically moving into their prime positions and prime slots. And so they're, they're mad and there's a certain amount of backlash and all you SJWs out there going around saying it's time that we have more representation, uh, in the power structure of different types of people. Well, uh, at least the youth are getting the message, right? Here's this kid from, oh, this disadvantaged kid from, uh, where was it? He's from uh, Columbia. Columbia, South Carolina. Oh. No, Columbia. this is Columbia University. Oh, oh, Columbia University. Oh, wait a second. I thought we were, well. He's not from South America. He's um, one, of these, uh, one of these guys at Columbia University who was, um, you know, uh, he might also be taking classes at Prager University. Yes, exactly. Um, now, look, he's drunk, and I don't want to pick on a drunk uh, college student who's 19 or 20 or whoever how old he is. Uh, but I'm going to um, just because he so perfectly captures the essence of everything he's absorbing from the... Dave Rubens, the Jordan Petersons, Molyneux, Tucker Carlson, the Molyneux, the Tucker Carlson, maybe even the Sam Harris to a certain extent. I mean, you set up a, you know, maybe it's not so much white versus this, but it's certainly about the inherent problems with other cultures. Whenever he analyzes hate, it's like Punjabi hate. Right. And here is uh, this guy who's getting a dual degree from Columbia and Prager University, uh, drunk on the town, and here it is. We built the modern world. We built the modern world. Who? Europeans. Europeans. Built the modern world. We invented science and industry. We invented science and industry, and you want to tell us to stop because, oh my God, we're so bad. Where did we invented the modern world? I feel you. You're so dumb. We invented the modern world. You fucking degenerate. We saved billions of people from starvation. Who? We built modern civilization. What? People are the best thing that ever happened to the world. We are so amazing. I love myself and I love white people. Say that one more time. Fuck yeah, white people. Fuck yeah, white men. We're white men. We did everything. Look, I don't hate other people. I just love my white men. I just love white men. Now look, he's drunk and he's sort of he's there's a little bit of performance here that I think he's trying to get a rise out of people and there's a little bit of provocateur. He's just having fun. Um and so and I don't know this guy, and maybe he's not a bad guy. There's certainly far worse human beings out there that we talk about on a daily basis. Um uh, some uh, moments ago and moments from now. So I, I I the the idea is less about uh people getting mad at this guy. And more about understanding like where that script comes from and that there are a lot of people out there feeding this guy that script and 
I think in that moment, my sense is he's just trying to get a rise out of um, some people. And, um, but he's like a big Nile Ferguson fan that just got a bit too intoxicated. Yeah. And, and, um, and I don't, you know, like I, I would encourage people not to take it out on him as much as taking it out on the sources of, of where his misinformation comes from. Because aside from the fact that he's American, not European, <laughs> and aside from the fact that uh, uh, many, many features of our modern life are a function of, of non-Europeans, from things like math <laughs> um, and all sorts of, of sciences and, and, and building technologies. Gunpowder. And, and, and gunpowder. Um, uh, aside from that, um, it's not like white people haven't had their opportunity to shine. You know what I mean? It's not like we, he's sitting there going, we, 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 when's our turn coming? Get those white guys, get them, get them, get them. <laughs> but that is the, uh, the message. That is the message of privilege losing their privilege and feeling like they're oppressed because of it yeah i i gotta give a few uh frowny points to columbia's core curriculum and all this too uh speaking as someone who went there it's a bit eurocentric i must say well there you go maybe they'll get a little less so now yeah, don't tell that guy i'll flip out again that's maybe what's going on who knows? Hopefully, he's maybe a, the, maybe it's changing. Who knows? Maybe he can be an SJW in four years. Get his SJW. Um, this is a heartwarming sc uh, story up in Rhode Island. Um, look, these days, we because of uh, tight state budgets and whatnot, we're trying to figure out how we can both um, maintain state funds, and shame poor people at the same time. And so uh, out of uh, Rhode Island, we have an innovative new program that's going to both shame people living in poverty, particularly their children, because the children are always, always the most vulnerable. If you really want to shame someone, the way to do it is to hurt the children and also maintain the integrity of state revenues. First at 5.30 tonight, the Cranston School Department is asking for its lunch money back. In a letter, they told parents they're hiring a collection agency because so much lunch money debt has gone unpaid. Eyewitness News anchor Steve Nielsen has the story that's all new at 5.30. Steve? Oh, Mike, Caroline, lunch debts are nothing new. It's a complicated issue. Some school departments and committees waive the unpaid balances at the end of the year. Others seek reimbursement. But on January 2nd, Cranston schools will send bills to a collection agency. Lunch is so much more than food. Nutrition is really important for healthy minds and healthy kids. Elizabeth Burke Bryant from Rhode Island Kids Count tells me it has lasting impacts. And when kids aren't getting uh, proper nutrition during the school day, it leads to a lack of con concentration. It can lead to behavioral problems. Those can lead to real, much more difficult um, mental health and other issues over time. But those lunches cost money. In a letter to parents, Cranston schools say the unpaid lunch balance is now more than $45,000. Raymond Vado with the school department writes to parents, the district lunch program cannot continue to lose revenue. In an effort to reduce our unpaid balance, the district has retained the services of a collection agency. Only one school committee member returned my phone calls Thursday for comment. He told me to speak with Vado at the school department who was unavailable today. A Cranston school committee meeting agenda confirms though it was the committee that unanimously hired the collection agency in October. Parents I spoke with outside schools Thursday afternoon didn't want to talk on camera, but all questioned the need for a collection agency. The leaders of the Orchard Farms parent-teacher organization wrote to me, the district sending out a blanket email to all families threatening with collections during the holiday season seems very Scrooge-like. We have to remember that we are talking about children and helping these children to thrive regardless of their family's financial status. The, the answer to this is to raise taxes. Now, I understand that it's possible the state school the uh, the school district doesn't have the ability 
to get these funds. And maybe this is a way of, of encouraging the state to raise money uh, via property taxes. But it is absurd. There should be no charge for school lunches. This is something as society that is part of their education and a need for their education. There's no reason to charge anybody for a school lunch. It takes away the stigma of people getting free lunches. Allow everybody to get a free lunch. Raise your property taxes. In fact, let's do it one better. Take away the property taxes as the funding for these schools. And let's have the federal government fund every single public school in the country. It's absurd. It's absurd. It's, I mean, it's just... It's like the ultimate uh, sort of illustration of the issues we're having. I mean... There's no such thing as a free lunch, but maybe there should be. Not in America. I mean, there. of course there's a free lunch. It's just a question of who's going to pay for it, and society should pay for it. There's also no such thing as an, uh, a free no lunch, because we're going to pay for this down the road. <laughs> we're going to pay for the kids who are uh, malnourished and not getting an education because of it. We're going to pay for all of it one way or another. The question is, do you pay for it now and make lives better? Or do you not? There's no, no, there's no, no paying for a free, uh, no lunch. We live in a society. We pay for everything. It's either you pay for it now or you pay for it later. It's like, it's like, you know, I, I, I save money. I haven't changed my oil in my car for 75,000 miles. Well, it's not like children of the future or anything, so it's right. probably fine. That's just unbelievable to me. Just crazy. Be curious if that's a DSA, a local uh, issue that's good for local DSA chapters. You to go talk out to uh, Daniel Denver. He's yeah. in the uh, Rhode Island DSA over there. Is he in Rhode Island? Yeah. Uh, come from an 864 area code. Who's this? I got uh, maybe one or two more calls to go. 864. 864 once. 864 twice. Go on. Uh, next one. Come from 501 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Good afternoon, Mr. Cedar. My name is Blake. I'm calling from Arkansas. We, we spoke before. Hello, Blake. Uh, what's on your mind? Well, the last topic that you were talking about was pretty interesting to me with the school lunches. Did you guys, did, did they include how many kids were in the Cranston uh, school district or? No. I was trying to, I was trying to cross-reference that with the 45,000 in negative balances. What, what, so you think that, that uh, they should be funded for free? That, that was, that was your proposition? To, right. To in New problem? York City, for instance, uh, the, all lunches are free. Okay. So those are negative balances for people that pay for their lunches and don't get them for free as, as part of, you know, um, I don't needy know children or, or, I don't or family know. programs or something. I don't know. I don't know if those are people who get reduced, uh, lunch. I don't know if okay. there are how much, you know, what their standards are for free lunch in that school. Uh, it could be people in Cranston, who can afford a uh, lunch, but just haven't sent it in. I don't know. It could be any of those, but I say free lunch for everyone so that there's no stigma uh, associated with getting a, uh, a, a free lunch. Uh, you just, that's part of school. Well, the children, I don't, are they aware of who gets what? And, and oh yeah, man. Do you have kids? You must have kids, right? I do. Okay. So you must know that kids, I don't know how old your kids are, but kids are the, uh, she's five. Yeah. Okay. You're, she is, it's a she. she? Yeah. All right, dude. Speaking as a guy who has a 13 year old daughter, get prepared for just mm -hmm. how mean kids can be. But yes, you get a free lunch and the other kids don't. You're the kid who gets the free lunch. 
And it gets a lot worse from there in terms of like the way you're stigmatized. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. I get, okay. So so your idea was for everything to be free. I mean, it's not my what, idea. What about, uh, it's, not, it's not my idea. I mean, they do it in New York City. It wasn't at my behest, but I think it's a good idea. Okay. So parents who decide to pack their children's lunch. They can. They, they can, would have to. No. As a taxpayer, they'd have to fund something that they're not utilizing. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Do you okay. intend to send your kids well to public school? Else. Uh, what, what What is a dollar a day or fifty oh no. cents a day or a dollar fifty a day? Blake, is that what, your name? How, what What, what Blake? kind of a message does that send to a child? Blake, that a parent wouldn't do that for them. Blake, Jesus. hold on. Yeah. Do, you, do you intend to send your uh, kid to public school? Uh, at this point, yeah. All right. So you know the not, dynamic. Hopefully, if, not, hopefully not long term. Okay, hopefully not long term. I mean, because that that implies to me that maybe you don't have the uh, either the private school option or you don't have the cash for the private school. Now, when your neighbor I'm talking to my niece to try to, to try to to try to get uh, a small home school. Okay, uh, are you trying to get a small home school? On. But when your neighbor comes up to you and goes, "Hey, Blake, why are my tax dollars supporting your uh, kid going to school for free?" What what are you prepared to say to that person? They have a problem with their tax dollars supporting my child. I would say to them, I wish we had a different situ- situation where we could get better education through uh, other means rather right. than forcing everybody. Yeah, well, to Blake, do I guess that what? Hey, not- that in a quarter gets me a phone call. Maybe. What if he says that, your neighbor? Say that again. Well, in other words, you can say, "I wish for uh, we had a different world." But that dynamic is the same dynamic you had a problem with in terms of lunch. And, you know, to send the kid to school right. is a lot more expensive and, and, than just the lunch, right? The well, brown bag. We were talking about lunches, not the education system in general. Well, but, we're talking about but, lunch in school. We're, we're trying to tackle these we're, things one at a time. Yeah, right? well, Blake, we're talking about lunch in school. Right. And I'm talking about a relationship very between low, people very, in, a relationship very, between very people and society. Well, very low effort. Well, low cost and low 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 cost and low effort maybe from your perspective, but I mean, you know, you don't want to get into a pissing match with somebody who looks at you and goes, "Wait, wait, it's pretty easy to set up a homeschool thing. Just do it in your 4500 square foot home like me." No, there's a lot of government regulations and red tape and permits and licenses. Hire and somebody to take care of it. All sorts of stuff you got to get through this. Hire somebody to, to take care of it. Hire someone full time to take care of it. If you cared, I mean, if you cared, but you don't have the money, uh, right? But for no, someone who's super so. wealthy, eh, we'd look at that and go, <laughs> "Come on, man! Don't care about your kid enough. Don't you care about your kid? You got a car, a right? Dollar Blake? a day is, is wait, wait. comparable to ten thousand dollars in a year. Wait, wait, is you that... got a car, don't you, Blake? Yeah. What kind of car do. do you got? It's a truck. Okay, a truck. What kind of truck? Get a lot of money for that. What kind of truck? You got a Chevy. Four, you got a Chevy. A Chevy what? Mm-hmm. Silverado. A Silverado. That's a thirty thousand mm-hmm. dollar truck, isn't it? No. How much? It was fourteen thousand brand new. Fourteen thousand brand new. It's just a work new? truck. It's just a work truck. Okay, so it's just mm-hmm. a single cab. Is that your only car? Or you have two vehicles. Where do you take the kids? No, that's my only. One. Well, you don't take the five year old in that. Sure do. You put her in a car seat in that front? Yep. You do? Mm-hmm. Okay. All right, so you got a $14,000 truck. Why are you spending all that money on a truck? Why don't you get a used one, dude? Put $10,000 into getting it. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is what... They, they, had, they had rebates on it. Well, I don't care. They had rebates on it. A $10,000 truck it is a cheaper purchase. than... $10,000 is yeah. cheaper than 14000 You would have $4,000 left. I mean, you see, you see my point here, though, right, Blake? Sam, that I could sit here in judgment yeah, of the way ha- that you we're spend. Your- this, we're having this huge, long conversation mm-hmm. about, like, you know, all, all all the governmental things, and you're asking me about my truck, and I'm talking about a dollar a day for your kid's lunch. Well, like, you can't do that well, going out to eat anywhere. You can barely, you could probably barely manage that at home. Well, uh, but producing that, uh, food in bulk. Well, that's right. I mean, that's why we have school lunches, but. Um, right, and and you're making the argument that a dollar a day is not uh, feasible. I guess I, I I don't understand 
I don't understand where this is coming from, Sam. I mean, if you have children, you're responsible for them on some level, aren't you? Well, dude, so don't tell me that when day? you're going and spending our tax dollars and sending them to public school. Why don't you homeschool them? Why don't you put them in private school? I, I just. Why don't you be responsible, Blake, right? instead of going out and getting a new Silverado because there's supposedly a rebate on it? You're just going to leech off the taxpayers. And, yeah, and then you're going to say, my, oh, my I can truck f- is seven years old. We're subsidizing you. We're subsidizing your they're truck not. purchase right. because we're educating your kids for free, man. No, you're not. Yeah. Well, what, why, are you, why are you muddling the conversation here? I'm not muddling but, anything. Uh, well, here's a question. I've had my truck for over seven years. Like, are you saying I live luxurious, or no? What's your argument? I'm just say, saying that. It, I'm just saying that you truck? are leaning on. Are you a homeowner or do you rent? Yes. You're a homeowner. I'm a homeowner. Okay. Mm-hmm. Why is it that renters, people who rent, have to subsidize you because of that home mortgage deduction? Why do you get a kickback? from the government on your mortgage payments. Why is that? I don't. It doesn't qu- it it doesn't qualify enough. The uh the extra costs don't uh, offset my any deductions that I would get for You don't the you're not eligible mortgage. for the home mortgage deduction? Yes, but it doesn't do any good for me. What do you mean it doesn't do any good for you? The amount the offset does not bring down my tax liability enough to offset the cost of the extra filings. What? Now, why is that? I don't understand that. Because tax people charge, because pe- tax people charge extra money. Well, I mean, d- dude, you can do your own taxes. My mortgage, my, my mortgage, my mortgage payment is $426 total. Okay. Uh, do you drive on the roads? Well, yeah, of course do. he does, but he only drives on private roads that he built. Right, right. Because if I'm riding, why are my, you comparing? Why, if I'm riding why, why my have bike we come around, to this point in the if, conversation? if I'm right, because you're the one who said the 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 person who brown bags their lunch and sends their kid to school with that lunch, why are they subsidizing the one dollar uh, a day lunch of the person who doesn't brown bag? And I'm asking you, why is the bike the guy who own, doesn't own a car subsidizing your roads? Why is the guy who's a renter subsidizing your home ownership? Why is the guy who doesn't have a kid in school subsidizing your kid going to school? And we all know the answer, Blake, because that's the way society works. It's the only way society can work. People take responsibility for their children, right? Is that that what we're supposed to do in society? I I, I would like to think so, yes. Personal responsibility. I mean, it's not, you know, my neighbor across the other side of the block's responsibility to feed my kid, right? Well, is it your your neighbor's responsibility to educate your kid? No, they don't. Well, uh, don't they pay taxes to go to, uh, to, uh, to keep that public school open so that your kid can go? And they don't have a kid. Yeah, and somebody and somebody and somebody paid for theirs. And again, well, they I don't, don't have a kid. The system. They don't have a kid. I mean, it, surely, it, 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 surely these people it, it, in Arkansas it's the who don't have a kid. Current, I'm willing it's, to it's accept. The status quo at current and what you're advocating for is more and more of a welfare state. And yes, less and less personal actually, responsibility. Actually, I would not call it a welfare state because I'm actually asking for something it that's absolutely more is. universal. Yeah, you'll learn so something that here. Everybody, so listen carefully. It's not even contingent upon your ability to buy it. It's not welfare. It is a universal service that is provided, very much like the concept of public school. You can go to public school if you're very wealthy or if you're not very wealthy. And society will subsidize it. Even all those people who don't have children, don't want children, don't care about educating, even those people who send their kids to private schools will subsidize the education of your kid and my kid at public school. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but you don't have a problem with that. You just have a problem where you want to draw do, the line. You just want you just want to keep kids hungry. Is that right? No. Well, but hmm. that's a typical response. I would expect that from you. Well, do you have an answer for it? I already answered it. I said no. Obviously not. Well, Blake, how do you reconcile this? Just tell me how you reconcile this. It's okay for you to send your kid to public school which is clearly subsidized by people who don't have children, never had children, never will have children. You have no problem with their tax dollars paying for your kids to go to school. But you have an issue. I absolutely do. 
you, 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 I'm sorry, you do? What? Yes, I absolutely do. All right, well, then why are you sending your kid to, to public school? Because I don't have the ability personally to change oh. the whole goddamn system. Okay, okay. Well, wait, 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 wait. I would but like you do to have ask the, Hold him. on one second. But you do have the ability to change the system where the kids get a subsidized lunch. Is that it? I'm not changing anything. Currently, you, people pay that can, and I don't think that we should uh, uh, lessen that responsibility, the $1 a day well, that they can what pay. What do you say to somebody in or, who says in order to, to you? In order, to, in, in order to further dissolve... Dissolve. The responsibility that people have for their own children. Dude, what's a bigger responsibility? Providing lunch or providing education for your kid? What's a bigger responsibility? Uh, they kind of go hand in hand. <laughs> well, wait a sec. <laughs> my my daughter my daughter my daughter learns a lot of things when I cook with her and she asks me lots of questions and well, that's great. she learned. Hey, what's a bigger responsibility? What's a bigger responsibility? I mean, you want to do it in terms of dollars? Does that make it easier if you do, as says? You feed your kid. If education doesn't really cost anything. <laughs> what? Wait. What are you talking about? It, it would cost me absolutely nothing if the government allowed me to educate my daughter. Oh, Wait a second. Nothing. Do you work? Do yeah, you work do. during the day? Yep. You do? Do you make money yep. when you're working? Mm -hmm. And so could you educate your daughter by taking her to work with you every day? Uh, partially. partially. But I can't bring her to work. So Okay. So <laughs> when you would educate her, would you stay at home and educate her? Mm -hmm. So would you be working at that time? Uh, yeah, I probably could. I could work something out. Yeah. So you can, you could both educate her. There's all sort there's, there's all work there's all sorts of options to work from. Home. So you could see so, so you could work at home and give her a good education mm -hmm. simultaneously. Oh yeah. No problems. Huh. Hey, here's a social reproduction question. Do you cuz cuz you think, you know, kids are the responsibility of the parents to do everything for, provide the money, lunch, whatever. Do you think it benefits uh, society and the economy that people are having kids and that they're being educated and growing up to become workers? There's no benefit or detriment to children, uh, generally speaking. It depends okay, on the, so if uh, people the parents stopped and, their, having and, their, kids. And, and their ability to support them. So if people stopped having kids, society would function fine. Yeah, until there was no more people and there would be no more society. Yeah. I don't think that, I don't think that I don't, I don't, got I don't, there, that, I don't think that we should, I don't think so that we should subsidize why should, uh, uh, people that aren't why capable should, or aren't uh, responsible. Why should low income people be subsidizing society by providing the service of reproduction and child rearing and lunch and education for free? Well, they, I mean, people don't have to have kids. And but 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 here's the point, uh, Blake. We're subsidizing you, but you have no problem with that. No, I do. I already told you that I do. But no, what, what I mean by no problem is that you continue to do so. You continue to do so, to which almost makes system. it even worse. Yeah. Do you, Do you buy gas? Uh, I do buy gas. Yeah. Okay, so you don't bike everywhere. That's correct. I don't bike everywhere. Okay. All right. Would you like it if everybody could bike everywhere sometime or if you didn't have to buy gas one of these days? Sure. Would that be good? That's good. That would be cool one day if that ever happened. Okay, uh, so you guys complain about climate climate change. Right. <laughs> and, and, and the same argument could be made for you guys. What's right? that? What's the argument? Yeah, transpose it. I, I don't. I don't agree with the way our education system is is uh, currently <clears throat> ensconced. Let's say, and you don't agree with us being dependent on fossil fuels. You claim that I'm using the welfare system by allowing my daughter to go to public school. Mm -hmm. I don't like that. I would like that to change. But I'm not you saying gas. I am not. You use gas. I'm not judging you for using you use gas. gas in your car. Are you? Am I? You're sitting here and saying there's Absolutely a problem. There's a problem with kids getting free lunch. 
It would be the equivalent of me saying like, I, it's okay for me to drive my pickup, but it's not okay for you to drive your pickup. That's what you're saying. And I'm not saying that about climate change. I want a government policy that will fund our ability to get off of fossil fuels. You see the difference here? It's subtle. It is subtle. But I'm not telling you that you need to be more personally responsible for climate change, whereas I shouldn't be. But you're sitting here telling people that whatever I don't need is what people should be more personally responsible for. Now, I happen to need public school. But I don't need a free Why do you lunch. Think we need public so I'm talking, you're articulating this to us. You've had five years to figure out what to do about your daughter's education. Now, I don't know if you've been sitting on your butt or what, but, Blake, uh, you're going to send your kid to public school. And you can blame the government all you want. You don't blame the government for making sure that your truck uh, is safe, do you? You don't drive around in your truck and go, God damn it, government wouldn't allow me to buy an unsafe truck. Do you say that ever? Of course not. Uh, of course no, you don't. I'm, I'm of sure course don't. you do not. Of course you don't. You don't drive, drive around and say, God, I wish all these roads were still dirt. I wouldn't have a problem with that. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Blake. That sounds like a little nihilist. I like, I like, I like dirt roads, Sam. No, I do too. Uh, I do too. Like, so, so, so your your uh, your idea here is that you want more and more things to be paid for. Yes. By the public. Yep. Yeah. That's nice talking to you, Blake. That's yeah. absolutely correct. And 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 where has that gone thus far? The welfare states increased, where, right? Where's that got? We've got more more and more kids, and, and we've got more and more kids. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, attaining less I'm, educational development and, and lower IQs and more poverty. Yeah, and all none of that is going it's away. Well, none, well, none, of, none of those things that you just said are accurate. But uh, I they're will. They're all tied together. Yeah, Sam, they're and also and more kids are without fathers, and you know. Then when? All tied together. Then when? Uh, then fifty years ago. Then sixty years ago. Then whenever, whenever the statistics were ever taken into account. Now, how many kids do you think were in school, let's say, let's say 120 years ago? How much education do you think kids were getting? Oh, wait, wait, wait. I misspoke. I know where you're going with this. I said, I said uh, more kids, right? Rates have also increased. I'm sorry. You think the rates of education have decreased since for 120 years? Or, I mean, what, what, what do you... Well, what, do you what, what do you define education as? I mean, are you just feeding kids information or are you teach them how to think critically? I mean, what's an education to you? Well, I don't know. If uh, you can think critically and you can understand and you can be a skeptic, hey, you can take it any when you get your homeschooling, and understand it and teach it. Blake, when you get your homeschooling syllabus uh, all prepared, can you send it to us? Uh, yeah, sure. Cool. I absolutely will. All right, well, I appreciate what, the call, Blake. What, 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 would you, what, what would you have to say about my homeschooling syllabus? I don't know. We'll see. Uh, like I think your kids should be watch, listening to this show every day. I would start with that. The first three hours of the day should be spent <laughs> listening to the majority report. Appreciate the call, Blake. Yeah, man. Bye. I hope his kid watches that call someday as part of her education. I hope she sticks around in public school. Yeah, oh, yeah. Seems. Oh, we have the co cash debate this Wednesday? Oh, wow. So wait, who is the guest that we pushed to Wednesday? That's next Wednesday. Oh, next Wednesday. Ah, okay, okay, okay. All right, folks, I'm sorry. I, I apologize. People are going to be upset. We'll take, I got to take one more phone call. Oy, oy, oy. <laughs> call him from 509. Who's this? Hey, Sam, this is Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan. I uh, got an interesting package in the mail today. <laughs> Uh -huh. I'm not going to discuss what it is. We're, they were supposed we're... to be. They were supposed to be delivered together, but um, the mug and the whatever. All right. <laughs> well, I'm not quite sure how we're going to break that out yet, because that uh, that deserves a little bit more of a presentation than I'm prepared to do. But I, I thank you very much. Um, I will take the the message under advisement. Okay. Hey. Um... Between Charlie Kirk and Blake from Arkansas, I'm like halfway to being a libertarian. If you uh, <laughs> keep getting owned like this, then I'm going to have to take my $10 somewhere else. Well, I, uh, I apologize. I'll do my best. Um... I will say uh, real quick, 
my dad um, was never that douchey, but he was very blue collar. Um, he was a commercial electrician, hardworking guy. My parents paid cash for shitty cars because we couldn't afford anything better. We never went on vacations. They were very frugal with their money. And then uh, my dad was diagnosed with MS when I was in middle school and had to retire early and um, really ended up leaning on programs that, yeah, he never said anything like Blake. I never heard those types of things in my house. But um, despite being the type of person Blake would look up to, um, my dad ended up needing to rely to this day, luckily, on uh, Medicare and um, Social Security, of course, and the union that he belonged to, IBEW. Shout out to IBEW. Um, which protected him from, uh, you know, obviously like early dismissal and uh, things like that. So uh, Blake sounds like a tough guy and probably a very hard worker, and I'm sure he loves his kids, and I hope that he never has to uh, depend on the programs that he so maligns. But as my father proved and many others like him, uh, the day may come when, uh, despite his best efforts and uh, the sweat of his brow, he will end up uh, like the people he thinks are uh, undeserving of uh, public support. So, um, yeah, it, yeah also, that's a nothing keeping him typical from... thing that you would say, Ronald Reagan. Typical scenario. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> typical scenario. Um, just another one of my hilarious calls. Yes, there thanks, you go. Sam. Uh, thanks for the call, Ronald Reagan. I, I mean, that is, um, that's the other thing. Even in Blake's perfect world that he has now, he's leaning on the the public, which is good, more than appropriate. That is why we have a society, folks. Um, and to make that society a more perfect union, we should be... Uh, making Blake's life even easier. We should be making L Blake's life even easier. We should be providing universal pre-K. I don't know if his child was already in pre-K, but there should be at least one year, if not two years, of free pre-K for all children. We have that in New York as well now. It's doable. Are our taxes high in New York City? Yes, they are. Yes, but my kid went to universal pre-K with good teachers paid for by the city. And there are some bad schools in, uh, in New York State, in New York City. There are some not uh, well-performing schools, largely, again, because of uh, funding disparities if you live in an area that's wealthy, the parents are wealthy, they raise more money because of limitations on our property taxes. But that's when things are all going good. Two-thirds of our elderly were taken out of poverty because of Social Security, because of social insurance. If you're lucky, Blake, you'll never need Medicare until you're, uh, or Medicaid or Social Security until your retirement age. But you're already lucky because you just have to make it to retirement age. And your daughter will not have to make sure that you are not eating cat food. And she will be able to have a more fulfilling life because of that. And as horrible as that must sound to you, the idea that your child will have more opportunity to pursue her ambitions or her dreams or choose to not pursue her dreams or ambitions because she can be confident that you will not be destitute in your old age. As horrible as that sounds to you, to a lot of people, in fact, the majority of people in this country, it sounds pretty good. And more of that would be better. Because there were people just like you 70 years ago, now 80 years ago, saying the exact same thing about Social Security. I mean, I don't want to call him out too hard for hypocrisy for using the public services and participating in a system he doesn't believe in because that's the same argument that people like to use on communists like myself. You know, oh, you call yourself a communist and yet you have a job. What's up with that? But 
when you are advocating for a, a different world, a different system than the one we have, one would hope that it would be a better one and not a worse one. I just want to clarify something. I am not making, I'm not calling him out for hypocrisy for sending his kid to public school. I'm calling out for the hypocrisy of saying that it's okay for me to send my kid to public school, but not okay for the school to provide lunch. Like there's a difference there. Like I get that. Um, I mean, I want higher taxes on the rich. I don't mean I want me to pay higher taxes. I want the rich and maybe that would implicate my taxes to pay more, but there's no point in me paying more if the society isn't. But I'm not going around saying that I arbitrarily think that I can pay, I could take this much services. And anything past the amount of services I need is wrong. That's what Blake is doing. I'm not saying he's a hypocrite for sending his kid to, uh, to public school. I'm saying he's a hypocrite to think that it's okay to have public school, but not okay to have free lunches because he decides that's where personal responsibility kicks in. I feel that's like he might like to privatize schools as well, but, uh, Stacy well, Mitchell had a graph here. The, the people, uh, grocery sales at dollar stores versus whole foods, uh, dollar stores sell a lot more groceries than whole foods do. And it's, it's a widening gap. All right, folks, going to take a couple more uh, IMs and then get going. I'm already way behind. Sorry. Jay-Z, uh, Gabe from Chicago. Oh, yeah, we did that. Jay-Z, uh, just a general reminder, while you in the U.S. enjoy a constitutional crisis every day under Das Trump of Führer, here in the U.K., we're seeing on a daily basis, indeed, some three days time, days events, which people will have expected to bring down a government. Brexit Britain is an absurd place. But with today's events, we may have taken a step back from the brink or we may have taken a step towards being Russia under Yeltsin. Oh, well, every day is exciting. Yeah, I understand. Things are back crap crazy there. Colton from Omaha. I don't feel great about my call last week. I was nervous and unprepared. Here's a written list of the lies AOC has told. The Daily Show, she claimed the Pentagon was asking for 100% budget increase. Not true. In the Late Show, she told Stephen Colbert in the fall of 95, she made repeated claims that if her parents got a puppy, she would walk it every day. That never happened. Not once. In the May of 20... Okay, I see this one. All right. In, in her bangs, do you ever get the feeling that Sam is not one of us? Bernie was in on it to win it. You're silly to keep saying otherwise. I got news for you. I know for a fact that when Bernie Sanders entered that campaign, he was not running to win the campaign. Why would this person say this with such conviction? Where are you getting that from? Thank you for handling Blake's stupidity so thoroughly. That was a really good call. Uh, Sean, I think the most WTF moment was today when Sam explained to everyone how to spell the word of. Militant apathy. Dude is right. Military does not translate well to law enforcement at all. JJ Cool. No, Michael Mondays are costly. The goofs from right wing Mandela about an incontinent Gavin are just something we can never really get back. Also, when Pence asked for gods for direction, is that Coke Industries? Winky de Anus. Is the couch Brendan official space with the office? Poor fella's going to have back problems. Sam Tinder's profile. Hey, girl, swipe right and you won't sweat the investment in your bed. Vespa. Has anyone made a comment, common comfort Coke joke yet? Also, Sam, we need to find the smocking gun. Left is best. Uh, Melissa Meaner. Sam, we have Richard Neal as our congressman, and he is about to head the Ways and Means Committee. He's been on it forever and isn't very progressive. What actions can we try and take to get AOC on that committee? Uh, what are the kind of things that we should do to hold him accountable? Uh, call Barbara Lee's office. Who are the other two? I can't remember. Um, Yeah. Call Pelosi's office. Uh, Ram Sant, Kavanaugh and Chief Justice Roberts agreed with the liberal justice in turning away two states, Kansas and Louisiana, and seeking a ban on public funding for Planned Parenthood. Very surprising. Mac from Maryland. Yes, mocking wasn't a typo. It was a leader of the free world, can't spell and doesn't like to read. And the final I am of the day, Elon Musk. Hello, fellow kids. Who wants to Pokemon go to space? All right, folks. See you tomorrow. It might take all the strength I got To get to where I want But I know somehow I'm gonna get there I wasn't looking when I just got caught Between the truth and the light bar But finding out won't make me feel any better Yeah, I know Choice was made for the option where you 
don't get paid.